friends, and welcome to an exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience, where today we're going to talk about this week's wrestling, of which the horribleness and awfulness of it will never actually be forgotten. Plus, we're going to talk about classic pro wrestling immortalized by the legendary Weasel Dooley. And to join me here to do all of this and even less, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, the man who never weasels out, he just plays a little possum, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. And what is weasel? Who is weasel? Let me <laughs> clarify. Let us clarify this today on the program. Uh, holy mackerel. I, it, we got a lot of good feedback from uh, last night's as we record this. It's a couple of days ago. This past Saturday, what was it? The 16th of the month of July. Svingooly on me TV showed the ghost of Mr. Chicken. I was in one of the breaks since I am one of the major global proponents of this cinematic masterpiece. And uh, Sven was nice enough to give me a couple of uh, mentions there and a couple of pictures of me and him in, in happier days. Actually, we're still both happy. We just we haven't seen each other since then. And uh, so we got a lot of feedback on that. And we will clarify some other things today, much in the tenor and tone of luther haig did you watch the ghost of mr chicken all the way through last night brian that's what the the people would like to know finally have you seen it all the way from start to finish i've made it all the way through i made it past sventuni so i did make it all the way through well the ghost of mr chicken wasn't a part of sventuni so i you made had, it you had that's right past the movie past sventuni into batman and then i passed out well you you haven't commented on the the tremendous hilarity and chills and thrills and spills and suspense of the great ghost of Mr. Chicken. I don't know about suspense or chills and thrills, but I did enjoy it. And actually, it becomes more enjoyable because of you. Because there are <laughs> things you hear in the movie, you're like, oh my God, that's why he says that. I never knew. The only disappointment I had, and it's a minor one, and I'm a big fan of Sven, uh, Sven Tuni, I was about to say, of Sven Gulli, I felt like they should have used a better print. Because I got a better print. When I downloaded it from Apple, I feel like they should have used a better print on the show. Well, they just, they said at the start of the program that it was a brand new print, a better print than before. Oh, really? Yes. Um, I must have bad reception. TV. I must have yeah. bad reception. <laughs> you need to get a better TV is what you need to do, pal. Get up with the state of the art <laughs> shit. The you best, know, they've got this thing that sits TV. on top of the TV now <laughs> called rabbit ears. <laughs> and and you get a better reception that way, especially if you put some aluminum foil on them, or either that or have your brother-in-law go over there and just stand there and hold it with, with one leg off the ground. That's perfect, Ben, right there. Don't move. So if you were going to see this movie and you fell in love with this movie, that means your mom went to see this movie. Did your mom actually like the movie? No, we. Uh, my mother, I've told you this before, Brian, you need to start keeping notes. As you're getting older, you're starting to slip a little bit. We didn't go to see this in the in the theater the first time it aired on television, broadcast TV, back when it was only three or four years old. Uh, that's when she said, oh, we're going to watch The Ghost of Mr. Chicken. And she loved the movie also. Yes. boy, Mama Cornette! She's the one who got me involved with that movie. Who is your favorite wrestling Luther? Um, well, d definitely not that fucking malpractice-ridden doctor of... <laughs> botchonomics that they got on AEW. Um, botchonomics. Let's see. You know what? There was... <laughs> there was... Uh, let's see. Who Who is a great wrestling Luther? Hmm. Luther Lindsay. Luther Lindsay. There you go. And Stu Hart would approve that. But you didn't think that the ghost of Mr. Chicken was scary? You ought to be scary. You ought to be eight or nine years old huddling up in front of the TV when that Vic Mizzy theme music starts playing and the organ keys start depressing by themselves and Don Knotts' eyes start bugging out. That's scary shit. You know what? I wonder how much it would cost us the license so we could use it during a show whenever you have one of your moments. Dun dun. Da -da. Da -da. Da -da. We can just start da -da. playing in the middle of the show. No <laughs> one else is using it. It can't be that much money. 
I'll have you know that I'm not going to be laboring away down here in the typesetting room too much longer, Brian. Pretty soon, I'm going to be working for the Chicago Trib. Anyway, I'm glad you finally got to see the movie. And I love the, you know what, movies from around that period of time, especially ones shot on the set, like the back lot, I love the look of them. Yeah, because all of the the neighborhoods that you see on all the 60s TV series were in this movie also, and all of the great 60s TV characters, they couldn't even list all of them. Everywhere you turned, a classic 60s and 70s TV character actor, what a cast, what a night, what a movie, what a spingooly. <laughs> but you all didn't right. watch Sven Tooney. I've, I conked out, at because we had the world-famous meatloaf. My world famous meatloaf for dinner. See, I've, I've had a hard week. I needed some cattle byproduct to make me feel better. Um, I've talked about my construction stories of the past. I'll have you know that the room without a wall, they put most of the wall back now. Most of the wall. Not all of it, but most of it. And I've got a giant stack of uh, drywall in, in one of the rooms there awaiting... Monday morning, the spray foam insulation people, you ought to see this spray foam shit. Boy, I tell you what, it's a chemical miracle. There's three or four different kinds of chemicals in this apparatus, and it mixes right as it comes out of the sprayer, and they spray it on the wall, and it instantly goes and expands into this foam that hardens fairly instantly and provides you a a seal against the outside elements. So when you've got a room spray foam insulated, it's like you're living in a cooler where the, the, the cold stays in and the hot stays out or the hot stays in and the cold stays out. Whatever exercise you're trying to, to do there, depending on the climate and the temperature and where you are in the world, you can achieve that with this spray foam insulation. Right. It's amazing. I just got an email from Stephen. I'm starting a class action suit against spray foam insulation. Hey, God damn it! Hazardous for your health. Hey, how you feeling? <laughs> anyway, it's really great looking uh, stuff, and boy, this is going to be so energy efficient for my remaining years or days or months that I have left <laughs> to live. And uh, and like I said, they're starting to put everything back together, so the construction is moving along. Uh, it was uh, the, the spray foam insulation, as I mentioned, was the last bit of thing they had to do before they start putting stuff back together. And speaking of putting things together, stunning Steve Bradshaw now has a new name. My neighbor in the back, he's now, remember when Steve Kern went from the fabulous ones to Skinner, he went from a sexy MTV style male beefcake model to a... <laughs> A fucking swamp dwelling tobacco spitting alligator hunter. Stunning Steve Bradshaw, we've changed his gimmick. He's now Trapper Bradshaw. He's out there in the woods with the, the, the traps and the skin. He dresses in coon skin from head to toe like Davy Crockett. And he's out there with the traps and the the pelts and the skins. And he is now taking down six raccoons. And three remaining. It sounds like an old timekeeper's call. Six raccoons down, three remaining. And two of them are giant mutants that he's caught on camera, the likes of which he the size he's not seen. He may have to get a bigger trap. So that's what's happening up there with the, or back there, I should say. And I'll have you know, Brian, that I'm here today on this program under duress only only because I owe it to the people, the cult of Cornet, the entertainment and the education they get from this program. I'm taking hours away from Harley Quinn's birthday. She is eight years old today. And I have paused the treat giving and the belly rubbing to come up here and talk to you. So I am a dedicated individual that honors his responsibilities. If I pulled myself away from a a gorgeous, cute, loving puppy on her birthday to talk to you. You. You could have brought Harley Quinn up to the office. Well, then she'd have to sit here and listen to me talk to you. And what fun is that? None, from what I hear. Absolutely. That's what the people are saying. 
And we, we'd also like to say happy birthday to Megatron Bagley. Ja Jack Megatron? Jacked up Jeremy Bagley's cat. It's her. It's his. His or her. His birthday today. Also, started to say her Megatron is a male name. So we got Harley's birthday down on the program there. Uh, uh, also, the ghost of Mister Chicken. I'm scratching that off. I have an apology. I'm going to issue an apology to the cult of Cornet members and to the people that logged on to JimCornet.com at a certain time this weekend. It's not an apology for me. It's an apology from the late Hotchkiss Featherbottom. <laughs> Actually, he's not dead yet. He just wishes he was. He was browbeaten and suitably chastened. What happened? This past weekend, as we had been announcing, we're putting the figures on sale for Australia and New Zealand, the ones we held back for those folks when the mail was screwed up, and that went off without a hitch. And we also mentioned that the a corny in the UK DVDs and the live in London DVDs would be back on sale after some absence. And that went off. And the big one, the crusade for children fundraiser of the last remaining original action figures, the red and yellows that had been in my garage closet and had been re blister packed. Cause there was some scratch and ding going on with the original blister packs those were supposed to go up at noon on Eastern time on Saturday the 16th, and Hotchkiss, to his credit, remembered that and did that, he thought. And because I was dealing with spray foam insulation people, I was not on the, uh, on the scene nor on the ball, apparently. And Hotchkiss didn't... He explained it to me, but it came down to he didn't either he he didn't press enter or he didn't press save or he didn't press something. He, he didn't tick a box. And it looked like it was up, but they weren't up. And I was alerted to this about 530 in the afternoon. And I immediately alerted Hotchkiss, along with performing a Yakuza like act on one of uh, his remaining fingers he started with 11 he's got eight now and that's the problem i think he hit the button with one of his prosthetic fingers and hit the wrong button but anyway so those action figures went up about five and a half hours late and if you were one of the people sitting there at noon wondering what the fuck well that's what the fuck and they may still be up right now for sale because we did people did catch on later in the evening and I'm not sure whether we're out yet or not. Cause I haven't talked to Hotchkiss again. He's waiting till tomorrow for that. Uh, but hopefully we have everything under control now. So if you go to Jim .com, if there's any still remaining, <laughs> that original action figure is up. If you're in Australia, New Zealand, if there's any still remaining, I don't think there are the bloody variant is available to you and the UK and London DVDs, and everything worked except the thing that I had been talking about the most. Also, the I'm a Sin Girl shirts. We have a few of those for the people who complained that they could not get their proper gender on the NAMI Fanami fundraiser, so that the limited edition I'm a Sin Girl shirts are up now. Get them while you can, because did I mention they're limited edition? And Hotchkiss, and uh, even if Hotchkiss doesn't survive the blood loss from yesterday, Fanny and Felcher have told me they will press on without him. Have you had any complaints yet from any of the listeners who have received a prosthetic thumb in the mail? And no, he keeps track of those because they, they cost so much. And also because, you know, the thing is, he tried to make his prosthetics look kind of similar to the fingers he had before and thumbs and his thumb strangely enough was longer than all the rest of his fingers so it's hard to get you have to special order those so he's very careful with them all right this is your show it is i got an email this brings something up here richard from new brunswick canada and when you hear this email you will think how the fuck in new brunswick canada did they know about this but he writes hey jim did you ever go to burger queen slash druthers 
I understand that it was a local Kentucky area fast food chain and wonder what your thoughts were about it. Keep up the good work. We're all pulling for you here. So we know, Brian, they're pulling for us in New Brunswick. And the reason I mention this is because did you ever hear of Burger Queen? I have heard of Burger Queen, yes. Did you ever hear of Druthers? Not sure. I don't think Druthers would translate, would have translated to the Northeast. Do you know where Druther, the Druthers comes from? I don't. Have you, do they, in the Northeast, do they have the saying, if I had my Druthers? Yes, I've heard that. Well, that's what it was. Believe it or not, <laughs> here's the thing. There was a chain down here in the 60s and early 70s called Burger Queen. It wasn't Burger King. It wasn't even Burger Chef, which was a thing then. It was Burger Queen. And the mascot, whereas Burger King had the king, right, with the crown, and Burger Chef had a chef with a chef's hat, Burger Queen had a fucking bee. Queenie B. And I don't and I think they were fair, I think they were local. I think corporate was local here. So apparently this woman probably was wandering around here in this town, but she was irrecognizable with this outfit on. It, she was wearing a bumblebee. She looked like one of the killer bees on Saturday Night Live, but with a nice disposition. She had the big fucking ass that bumblebees have with the stripes. She had the wings. She had the big thing with the antenna on her head. And she was Queenie Bee. And Queenie Bee loved for all the kids to come to Burger Queen. And we had a Burger Queen. That was the first fast food place besides Jerry's restaurant, home of the J-Boy, that we had here in my little, formerly little suburban town. Now we got all the, the chains. So when I was a kid, we'd go to Burger Queen, and that's where I met the Harlem Globetrotters when I was nine years old. Metal Arc Lemon and Curly Neal and Geese Osby and two of the other job guy Globetrotters came out in the parking lot, shot baskets, and signed autographs before their game at, at, at the uh, Louisville Gardens that night. But the point is, you were wondering if there was going to be one. Burger Queen wasn't doing too good as a chain and with big fanfare and all these commercials changed their name to Druthers. And the marketing behind this from Burger Queen to Druthers and the bee disappeared, poor Queenie bee, was that that's the play on words. What would you druther have? Well, I'd druther have this and that. Well, you can have whatever you'd druther have at Druthers. And needless to say, every single fucking Druthers, as I recall, within about a year and a half, became a paint and body shop or a fucking lawnmower repair service. It was the quickest decline of a fast food franchise I'd ever seen in my life. So that's a, the moral to the story is whenever you've got something established, even if it's not doing too well, don't change the whole goddamn thing into left field because people won't get it. And also, I'd rather have had Queenie B. She was nice. Uh, it's one Thank of those, you, Richard. One of those days, huh? Thank you, Richard, from Nova Scotia or New Brunswick or wherever the fuck you reside at. You know, so one of these days, you just you just wish you had some good news. In, oh, oh, good news. Good news, everyone. Do I hear that Raw is going back to TV 14? Well, that's the rumor, and it's a funny story, because apparently it came out that this was going to happen, and then it was walked back, and now the story is, it may happen. It could happen. Well, a lot of things could happen if... And and could and maybe as my as Mama Cornette used to say, if a frog had wings, it wouldn't bump its ass on the ground. But well, Jim, I have a report here from Sports Illustrated or SI.com by Joseph Courier. It says so. This is not just just Ned leaking this. This is Sports Illustrated. Th these are these are professionals. Well, it says Joseph Courier, Wrestling Observer. So apparently, this is someone from uh -oh. the Observer site. So wait a minute. Now, Sports Illustrated is stealing from the Wrestling Observer. Well, it has an editor's note here at the top. 
uh, as of the other day. An earlier version of the story misstated that WWE Raw will be changed to TV 14, oh. beginning with the show on July 18th. In fact, WWE is just considering a change for future oh. programs, and the rating of Monday, excuse me, and the rating for Monday show will be unchanged. That's the editor's note. Here was the article. Well, I guess it's not been changed, too. A change could be coming <laughs> in WWE Raw's presentation. Andrew Zarian of Mat Men reported Thursday that WWE is considering a change. To see, this is all changed now. <laughs> that would see Raw become a TV-14 rated show on the USA Network. If that does happen, this would be the first time since 2008 that WWE's flagship television program hasn't been rated TV PG. After initially reporting that the TV 14 rating would go into effect next Monday, Zarian posted an update noting that is no longer the case. So I guess whether they do it or not... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me do it for old Andrew there. Never mind. The idea that they're considering this, though. Well, that's what I saw everybody jumping on this, like, ooh, big thing. <laughs> What right now, with the the cast of characters, so to speak, the talent roster they have on the WWE programs and the creative team or decisions that they have or they're making or anything that they're doing with the program, would what about that would suddenly be enhanced or suddenly become must-see television? if they bumped up from TV PG to TV 14 and yeah, I mean, besides more people under the age of 14 wanting to watch it because they're not supposed to, what would change? Cause the, it's, it, that's not the, whether you can cuss or not. Uh, the, oh my gosh. I can see in a writer's meeting. Well, if they, if they couldn't say shit over there on TBS, we'd be beating them even, even more. You know, what? What about loosening language restrictions or showing a little bit more side boob or getting close to the areola of the matter or whatever? How would that enhance the program that the WWE is presenting right now? I ask you, Brian, or, or speak on behalf of the masses. Well, I don't know that it really could, and it's important to note, too, no matter what the rating for the show is, it's not going to change the demographics of who's watching it, which is a much older audience. But the other thing is, if we're going with the idea that TV 14 all of a sudden changes this show, it'll be socially relevant, it'll be cool, it'll be hip, it'll be something more current and feel like it's lively, probably not. <laughs> I don't think any of that's really going to happen because under the, what is it, the PG era, we saw a wrestler lit on fire. At least one, actually. Was it just one? We saw one drown in a lake by the guy who later got lit on fire. Yeah. And then and then the, the eyeball got popped out. Yeah, that's that's TV PG. <laughs> the eyeball got popped out. So what's the big difference gonna be? What would really change? Well, maybe they'll make it a real eyeball instead of a ping pong ball next time. Is it less attractive or more attractive to advertisers? I <laughs> Again, I don't know that the advertisers are going to notice any difference because in the attitude era, everybody has, has again, just laid the praise for all of this remarkable television at the feet of the fact that they could do more. They were edgy. They were controversial. They were you know, of, of stretching, pulling the envelope or stretching it or pulling it or expanding it or whatever. It was the talent. It was the talent and then the talent being allowed to go over the top in those, ma uh, in those categories, language or violence or whatever. It wasn't just the underneath guys that could say, you know, choppy, choppy, your pee pee, or, you know, everybody panned universally may young giving birth to a hand or whatever. That was garbage. It was garbage then. And it's garbage now. But what the magic formula was, was the talent at the top being allowed to go farther 
than they had been allowed to before. And also a lot of the talent at the top, either being new, Steve Austin, The Rock, or refreshed, Undertaker, Hart and Michaels, as we've seen, the Rivals program. All that played a part in it. The underneath shit just cluttered the show up and gave the Attitude Era its highlight reel of shitty garbage wrestling moments and stupid things that caused the people to pan it and attracted improper attention from advertisers. The stuff at the top of the cards is what worked and that's what you should always, you should never, if this was X-rated, the opening match shouldn't be allowed to say fuck or give a blow job in the ring. That's just common sense. So right now, the problem is you don't have an Austin, you don't have a Rock, you don't have a Bret Hart, or even Shawn Michaels, definitely an Undertaker, or Mick Foley, or I could go on and on. Look how many names I just mentioned that were all in the company at basically the same time. There are none of those people. And there's been 20 more years of bad television since that time of all those stars. And people are more immune and numbed to angles and bumps and controversy because they've seen so much of it, not only so much of it, but so much of it done badly, so much of it done by subpar talent. And then you've got the guys now that nobody cares about because they're interchangeable with gen generic made-up names and generic looks. If a guy named Stone Cold Steve Austin comes in looking like Steve Austin did and says, I'm going to kick some son of a bitch's ass, well, that might have got your attention. What about a guy named Grayson Waller now? Going to come in and just because he can cuss on TV, I'm going to kick some son of a bitch's ass. What the fuck is this, Benny Hill? It doesn't matter whether they can go over the top with language or violence or things that the kiddies shouldn't see. They see enough in schools when they're doing drills about active shooters and we're terrorizing our children because we won't fix our fucking ridiculous goddamn laws in this country. I don't think them hearing the word titty will fucking give them nightmares for the rest of their life. But it won't make any difference if nobody gives a shit about the person saying the word titty. If the talent's not over... If the creative sucks, and if the whole show is boring, loosening up those restrictions won't make any difference in the show. People will still not be over. It'll still be boring because they're not probably going to want to go war with violence. If it's Vince, I know him. They're going to go with language and sex to get the young people that were young 25 years ago and were impressed by you know, seeing fucking women flashing their boobies at the arenas. Now, if you're seven, you've seen that on the internet. You've also seen the German shepherd fucking the girl with the boobies you saw on the internet. So how is this a, a cure for the malaise that the WWE finds themselves in of their own volition and their own doing? It's not. It's just a chance for Vince to try to give everybody Tourette's again. And, I mean, which one of the girls is going to be barking like a dog now? Whichever one he's sleeping with. Hey, I'll have you know that he would be insulted that you insinuated that he was sleeping during that time. He was merely resting his eyes. See, the problem is you could make the rating whatever you want. It's a systematic problem. We all look at a Steve Austin or a Rock, and it's undeniable. Just the superstar magnitude, to use a Vince McMahon kind of term, <laughs> that they give off. But if either one of those guys got signed today off the indies or got signed today off being something other than a wrestler and came in exactly the way they were, they'd be changed right away. We need to change your name and own it. We need to make sure you talk this way. Don't do this, do this. Work differently. No one work. They would change them and take away everything that makes them special. The toughest thing to do in wrestling is to be a talented wrestler and get signed by WWE, and somehow retain a lot of that when you get to the main roster, if you have to go through their system. 
Well, so anyway, TV 14, uh, I don't think is the answer to their problems, but they're considering it. It ain't going to, it's probably going to come down to what they think the advertisers will like because there's been no mad panic rush to improve their product so far. They may have think they've done it, but they haven't done it. So I don't think they're in a panic now to make major changes to make it better. I think it's whatever the advertisers will most like because they're not they're not doing a show for fans anymore. They're not doing a show to try to sell tickets. Even AEW, Tony Khan is trying to do a show for the fans that like his company, not anybody else. Anybody else that already doesn't like it ain't going to start liking it because of anything they do because it, it's specifically for that nonsensical wrestling fan that doesn't want anything to make sense but at least they're trying to do a show for their fans. The WWE is not doing a show for anybody except they're filling time. They're, they have a contract to provide X amount of hours of content to their various broadcast partners per week or month or year or whatever, and that's what they're doing. They don't have to sell a goddamn ticket. They don't have to sell a pay-per-view. And that's a good thing because they would be and I'm, I'm sure they are now selling fewer of all of those things than they ever have in, in their existence, but it doesn't matter because their money is guaranteed. They have become the... Remember when I said guaranteed money in the wrestling business for a lot of the guys killed it because then you got the guys that could be... that are great wrestlers, but that are also wanting to fucking fuck somebody around and take advantage of the situation and do the least work for the most amount of money. And so they, they killed your incentive and killed your goals as a performer in wrestling to never be able to make your money bigger because it's already guaranteed for you. At least it did for me. But now they've become the first wrestling promotion where they're on a guaranteed contract. Did you ever think about it this way? They don't have to show up for, they don't have to take the extra bumps. They don't have to work extra hard. They don't have to put the extra oomph in the promos because they're on guaranteed money. As long as they send three hours of something to the USA Network on Monday, they're getting paid. And they're down now to where the people that are still watching this thing, it's going to be hard to run them off because they've been trying for a while and those people are still there. So is this a situation where they're just showing up for work to get paid and walking through it with their programming? And they've come to the realization that AEW is what it's going to be and it's not going to really be any danger to them at this point? You know, it's like you said, they don't have to worry about too many things other than the television rights fee. And the rights for, you know, a peacock to peacock. the WWE Network. Other than that, they don't seem to worry about house shows anymore. The average pay-per-view is now just literally the average pay-per-view. WrestleMania is still a big deal, but they don't sell that. It's just an event on Peacock. I mean, you kind of put it in the best way. They are the wrestler. They are the lazy wrestler under a guaranteed contract. And WrestleMania, honestly, what I think... The main value to WrestleMania for them these days, I mean, yes, they like the millions of dollars. But 25 years ago, Vince McMahon's head was in WrestleMania. This was a big payoff. This was the big show. This was the time you're making a lot of fucking money. And now it's almost like we've got to fill up whatever stadium we're in both days in a row as a positive PR move and to get the great video and to show how over we are rather than because they're not depending on just that day for a large chunk of their annual revenue anymore. So it's become now instead of the big day to make more money than you make any other day of the year, it's now become, well, we got to fill this thing up and make it look great and show everybody that we're still a big deal. The money, that singular day's money, is not as important to Vince or anybody else as it used to be. So I think if, if it ever comes that they cool off enough to where they can't 
run WrestleMania in a stadium and sell most of the tickets, they'll still be in the stadium and they'll be giving the fucking tickets away, I bet you. Hide and watch. Well, we will see what happens with their rating. Uh, by the way, no one's saying anything about SmackDown changing, just Raw. Um, well, and that would be... Uh, it would be harder to do that, especially without the network being fully on board for it, because the Fox network stations are still broadcast stations. They are under different, at least it used to be this way, is it still? They're under different regulations from the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, than a cable broadcast outlet. I believe so. Yes, that's still correct. So, therefore, if they did make the change on Raw, it still might not be something they could even have as an option on SmackDown because they're on broadcast television. So they might have to actually just do a good fucking show. I hate to pop their bubble, but instead of saying fuckity fuckity McFuck fuck, they might actually have to have somebody interesting do something people are interested in. I don't want to get all crazy or anything. You know what I'm interested in, Brian? No, I have no idea. I'm interested in a healthy breakfast. That's what I'm interested in because at my age now, and I'm for whatever reason in fine health, I'm, I'm in fighting fit, fighting for air and fit for nothing. But I'd be even <laughs> worse if I wasn't waking up every morning to a delicious, healthy bowl of Magic Spoon cereal. Folks, if you're worried about whether your rights fees are going to be renewed by the network next year and you lay awake at night, if you're worried about whether you're going to be allowed to say shit the next time you're on television and you lay awake at night, don't do that. That stresses you out. You need to get a good night's sleep and you need to look forward to getting up and having that healthy bowl of magic spoon with zero grams of sugar, 13, to 14 grams of protein, and only four to five net grams of carbs in each serving, low carb, keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free and only 140 calories a serving unless you're a pig and eat two, and then it's only 280. So you're still ahead of the game here with all of that regular cereal, having all that sugar and carbs and junk and additives and preservatives and formaldehyde. I'll have you know you will not find any formaldehyde, kerosene, or coal oil in the Magic Spoon. They've got cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry muffin, maple waffle, Honey nut, cookies and cream, cinnamon roll, concrete. No, wait, I'm I'm reading one There's of my There's no concrete cereal. No. I'm reading one of my contractors' estimates there. I started I off the wrong page. Folks, if you go to magicspoon.com, no concrete in the cereal. Of course there's not. For heaven's sake, they make it with mortar. Go to magicspoon.com slash Jim right now to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try the magic for yourself. And be sure to use the promo code Jim at checkout to save $5 off your order. They've got the 100% happiness guarantee. All 100% of you will be happy after you eat this cereal. Elsewise, they will come to your house. They will refund your money. They will pick up the unused cereal, slap you in the face, and be on their way. Remember, they will not your- slap anyone. There will be no assault involved with Magic Spoon, a magical, fun, delicious cereal. But if you ask for the money back, well, then their You their get your money back with a big smile. Yes. It, well, yes, and then their commitment to you is over with, and after they hand you the money and smile at you, then they're going to slap the shit out of you. That's No. For making them come all the way over there. Well, that, after the transaction's over, once they've given you your money back, they have no more commitment to you as far as your happiness. They can make you as miserable as they want to. Well, they could, but they are very nice people with a very nice cereal that people should try. There will be no slapping of the listeners by Magic Spoon. Well, I don't want these cheap fucking conniving assholes out there in the general public to get the idea that they can take kindness for a weakness and just take the Magic Spoon people for for granted and just order the cereal and then just ask for their money back and and just willy-nilly go on about their business, there will be some repercussions. Well, they will enjoy the cereal. Let's go back well, a yeah. step. They're going to enjoy the cereal so much, they're not going to worry about the money-back guarantee. They don't need it. It's going to be delicious. That's why I'm talking to the majority of people who aren't assholes that are going to eat this delicious cereal and enjoy it and appreciate it, but some weasels out there, no pun intended for our later segment, will want to get their money back just to 
get somebody, get something over on somebody. And for those people, an ass kicking is in order. And after the Magic Spoon people come to your home and hand you your money, shake your hand and say, okay, we're sorry the transaction didn't work out, and you close the door, then that person could come back up to your door a couple minutes later. All bets are off now. And either set fire to some dog shit and leave it on your front porch. There you porch, go again. There you go. Ring your bell again and, and slap the taste out of your mouth. Ladies and gentlemen, you can enjoy Magic Spoon cereal knowing that you are ingesting the finest, the healthiest, the best, and also that no one is coming to your doorstep. You don't have to worry about fisticuffs or flaming dog shit. Well, Just that's true. Delicious breakfast with Magic Spoon. As long as you stay in line yourself and don't get too fucking uppity, start demanding your money back. No, they, things and such of these people. They've they've been nice to you. Everybody else likes the shit. I don't know why you're so fucking different. I like it. Don't talk well, to me. and what do you take it up for these other people for because then? I don't think anyone's going to be needing their money back. It's a delicious, wonderful cereal. Well, I mean, there's personally no reason like for it. you and me to argue about this. For the one or two <laughs> little assholes out there going to ask for their money back, they're going to get their shit kicked. Not officially by Magic Spoon. No, they're no, not. No, nobody will be able to trace it back officially. Magic Spoon has no known enforcers. I just want to say that right here on the air. You have nothing to worry about other than. Are you going to enjoy too much of this delicious breakfast? That's I will worry. say, I will say truthfully, no one has ever testified under oath in a court of law about an, a physical assault by a magic spoon emissary. There's never been that testimony. Those, those witnesses disappeared and it was completely unrelated. They shouldn't have gone outside their homes before the trial. I don't know why I'm going to egg you on with this, but do you think they come and punch you in the mouth or do they hit you with a spoon right in the face? Actually, that would be great if they just came and, and just hit you on the head, just a one boom, right on the head with a fucking spoon. That's for you. You don't like our cereal? Boom, I give you with this spoon on the head. And boom. What is this accent you're doing? The who boom, that's who the is this man that came to the house? That's the, that's the magic spoon. Yeah, you don't like my cereal? Boom, I that's give you on the Super head. Super Mario you're doing there. What is that? Yes. That's why you know Magic Spoon is an offshore located company. <laughs> no, it's not. Don't it's say not? That. No. Well, that's not bad. There's plenty of fine shores in the world. I give you boom with your. No matter where Magic Spoon is, ladies and gentlemen, rest assured you have a delicious breakfast on the way and you'll enjoy it. They don't it. like to be found, actually. You can't really find out where their main headquarters is. They try to keep that under wraps. Well, that's not true. I've spoken to them. They're very nice people, very understanding you people. you to them on the phone? Have you ever actually been to their headquarters? I have not. You don't? It could be It could be a, a front for a Colombian drug cartel. What are you saying? Idea. Are you saying you don't think Magic Spoon's corporate offices exist? Well, you know, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them. They could be just floating around different places. Or they could be magical. They could be. It's magically delicious. No, that's another no, cereal. That's... We can't use their tagline. This is Magic Spoon. Oh. It's better than that because it's healthy delicious. Healthily magically delicious. No, no magically delicious. No? You can't use that. That those belongs to another still, cereal company. Do those other people still exist? I thought Magic Spoon was the only cereal left. Well, it's the only cereal in your cabinets and my cabinets, but for the uh, plebeians out there, there may be some other cereals that they see. Well, I thought that everybody smartened up to the fact that there's poison in every other cereal. Well, no, don't say Magic that. Spoon. That's not true either. You can't say that on the air either. That's not no, true. No, it is. The additives and the preservatives and the sugar. You sugar is, a, poison. is poison to the human being. Well, you sound like and Mayor Bloomberg now. I don't know if that's exactly It'll make your teeth true. rot. For heaven's sake. You know what? As a matter of fact, did you ever, when you were a little kid, did your grandmother ever say, come here and give granny a little sugar? No. Turn me off of sugar. No, mine never said that. Uh, but your, grand, your grandmother was a big bully, wasn't she? No, she was a wonderful woman. And I have to think if she was alive, she would have been giving me magic spoon right now. Delicious, healthy. I can't believe we're still in this spot, but I'm not going to let it end on a bad note. Delicious and healthy. It's magic spoon. Dot com slash Jim. All right, well, I guess we ought to get into some more news involving one of our favorite members of the AEW roster. I was watching, uh, or not watching, but looking through Twitter and saw some comments about this, but I believe you have found the 
the clip that's germane to this incident. I am not a regular listener of Chris Jericho's podcast. I'm, I'm sure he has some. I'm just not one of them. Who could be? Um, well, it, it, you know, it would probably be burdensome, but somebody's got to do it. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. But in this case, it got a little interesting because, you know, we've, we've seen Jericho. I think he's one of these people who just likes to have his picture taken with famous people regardless of their ilk. He's had pictures with Donald Trump Jr. I think he was on the program one time. Uh, I think he was a big fan of one of the one of the other right-wing lunatic rock stars like Ted Nugent or Kid Rock, one of those type of people. But he's had the other side of the coin on, a guy who didn't necessarily say some things that Chris Jericho might have wanted to hear recently, Oh, Governor Jesse Ventura, who's always been a different kind of fellow uh, and has his beliefs and doesn't mind mentioning them in public forums. And apparently, old Jericho got blistered by Jesse. Well, he wasn't blistering Jericho. He was blistering former President Pig shit, and Jericho had to sit there and listen to the truth for once. And I'm pretty sure that that didn't fall very well with him since his wife was vacationing in D.C. to celebrate the insurrection and attempted overthrow of our government, and he himself contributed money to a fucking criminal psychopath that tried to, again, overthrow democracy. And Jesse, apparently, from what I have heard, told Chris Jericho what he thought of the whole matter on Jericho's own show, and Chris sat there and nodded a lot. Is this, have I summarize this appropriate appropriately here i believe so we'll play a little bit of audio so you can actually review it and hear the real thing as opposed to whatever you're reading but it's interesting to note that jesse ventura i believe and chris jericho share the same agent i mean jesse was the one who brought barry bloom into wrestling and barry bloom is jericho's agent correct uh well i haven't checked with him recently i think at one time that was the case and barry bloom actually like you said jesse brought him into wrestling at Various points uh, was the guy who, over the past 25 years, who's represented, I would say, what, 80 or 90 percent of the major names getting major contracts in wrestling, or at least he did at one time, especially. I know when when Jim Ross was the head of talent relations for the WWF, he didn't look forward to speaking to Barry Bloom uh, about a number of subjects, and when J Jr. left that position, Barry Bloom became Jr.'s agent, so he must be good. Let's now go. Here's a little bit of audio again. Chris Jericho speaking with the former governor of Minnesota, not just someone who's in the politics, a former elected official, Jesse Ventura, on his little podcast. It's like right now, Chris. Do you know why I hate the Republican Party right now? And I'll say it blatantly on the air with you: why I hate them? Why? Because I took an oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And on January 6th, the Republicans attacked my capital against the Constitution. And I saw a Confederate flag get carried through my capital with their blessing. And no one, and I mean no one, to this day, from the Republican Party has apologized for it. All I want is an apology. I want the Republican Party to tell Governor Jesse Ventura they are apologizing and are sorry that a Confederate flag got carried through his national capital. Right. I don't think that's too much to ask, but I don't think it'll ever be done, Chris. I'd hate to admit something, but I'll try to word this as best I can. If I would have been security that day, the dude with the flag, I often wonder if he'd be breathing today. Mm -hmm. Get my message? <laughs> yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. It takes a lot of ingredients to fix or build a car. <laughs> <laughs> that's how he inserts his hands, the fucking dick. Listen, that's hysterical because that was the perfect opportunity for Jericho to say, listen, my wife was there and I want to speak up for those people. He said nothing. Oh, well, remember all the people that were saying, well, I was there. It was just a tourist visit, just a just a protest, just everybody normally going about their business. It was fucking chaos. We've seen the video. 
There was your point, Chris. There was your time. You could have told Governor Jesse Ventura, who may not have been the greatest elected politician in the world, but he's been one, so he has more experience at it than you. He knows how this shit works. There was your time to say, no, it's all been misunderstood. There were voting irregularities. There was fraud committed. People were outraged. No, you sat there like a little bitch with your tail tucked between your legs when you heard the truth, just like every other Republican is doing right now, that they're hearing the truth from the people that were there in the January 6th commission under oath. Republicans, people that Trump appointed alike, saying he was unhinged, saying that he was criminal, saying that he was trying to overthrow the government by illegal means. It's all been outed. And Chris, you had the chance and you couldn't say anything because you know why? Because there's nothing to say. But you could have, he could have called home and had his wife called and apologized to Jesse Ventura for being there when she put up her vacation pictures on Facebook, here we are trying to help a fucking criminal psychopath overthrow the government. And we're all blonde. Jesse Ventura never met a conspiracy theory he didn't like. And he, even he, when he hears all this, like, that's nuts. <laughs> he lost yeah. the election. It's too, when it's too <laughs> much for him. <laughs> Anyway, so we'll we'll keep an eye on uh and maybe they can book that in AEW. Jericho versus Ventura. It would have name value. Oh, Barry Bloom would love to negotiate with Tony again. I'm sure he would. I would I would imagine that Tony, every time Barry Bloom sits down with Tony Khan, Barry has to bring an extra Brinks truck or two to carry off all the extra money because that would literally be Einstein teaching a second grade math class. I'd pay money right now to hear Ventura talk with Linda McMahon. I'd pay money to sit there <laughs> and listen to it. Well, would you pay money to watch AEW Dynamite? Uh, not in the last few months, I wouldn't have, no. <clears throat> oh, boy. I would have paid money if somebody could have warned me ahead of time. You, you son of a gun, you didn't do it. Uh, I would have paid money not to see this because... We'll try to go through this show as quickly as possible. Everybody's been waiting for my thoughts on the first segment of this show. And I don't even want to talk to anybody about the first segment of the show except one person, the person that was most harmed, most offended, most damaged by the segment that opened Dynamite this past Wednesday night, July 13th. They actually booked Wardlow against the company mascot, our little dog pockets. And I'm not going to talk about the match because it wasn't a match. It was a masturbatory, self-indulgent fantasy by the Puddin' Gang and Tony Khan's favorite little fucking Halloween costume. And they're playing with their, Tony's father's money, I understand. Nobody's really going to be harmed by this except Tony's father, and he's got plenty except for one other person, Wardlow. Wardlow is the one that's going to suffer for this because as long as the Richie Rich of pro wrestling has all the money that he wants to spend on his vanity project and Little Pockets is his favorite wrestler that he likes to dress up at like on Halloween and he will interject him in this program no matter what. Like I said, Pockets is getting the same amount of money and he gets to be on TV. And the Puddin' Gang, they're clearly not qualified to be in the spot they're in, but they get to be on TV. And Tony gets to do his thing and Tony's father ain't going to miss the money. But Wardlow is going to miss the money. And Wardlow is the one that's being hurt. And Wardlow is the one that apparently has nobody looking out for him now. And Wardlow is also the one that's new enough in the business that he doesn't know what they're fucking doing to him. So they've gone this far, this long running thing where finally Wardlow could break away from MJF and the, Bound, as New Jack would say, in the chains of slavery to, new, to MJF, 
and now he breaks loose and he's a monster and the people are loving him and what do they do they start putting him in with job guys thinking that if he beats job guys up that gets him over which is ridiculous you beat up job guys incidentally on your way to wrestling main event stars is how you get over you don't get over by wrestling job guys as your meat and potatoes so first he was fighting 20 unnamed security guards with a phony lawyer behind them now if if you even tolerate or even like pockets and this whole comedy wrestling gang thing what sense did this match make two baby faces who to cheer for you're splitting your audience you make your monster look like a fool just because he was out there trying to, and stooging for pockets, trying to make it plausible that this big, good-looking guy is taking bumps for an emaciated Jiffy Lube employee. And there's pockets kicking out of Wardlow's shit that just last week he was beating up 20 grown men, and this week he can't handle a goddamn homeless bum. The bum's getting two counts on him because they're afraid to hurt anybody's feelings over there and say, okay, Pockets, we've indulged your fucking twiddling yourself on television with your hands in your pockets for three years now, but now we got, we got to get a guy over to make money, so it's going to be one tackle pancake. Power bomb, one, two, three, thank you for coming. But they can't do that. So... I'm speaking directly to Wardlow right now. Here is the best advice in your current position. Here's the only career advice I can give you. I've been involved with finding, discovering, helping develop or train talent for 30 years. More. Here's the best career advice I can give you. I want you to get a pen and a paper and write down what I'm saying. Vince McMahon, area code 203. John Laurinaitis, area code 203. Scratch that, not him. Bruce Pritchard, <laughs> area code 281. Six, he's from Houston, that's his cell phone. And actually, don't even worry about him because if you can't get Vince, no use trying to get to Bruce, go to Jeff Jarrett. He's going to be running that whole fucking thing in three years. 615. Well, I have a feeling that's there's, the, there's going to be some bleeping here this week on the show. <laughs> that's the only career advice I can give Wardlow at this point. I was embarrassed and uh, for him and ashamed for the company that they would present this with one of the only two guys, MJF being the other one who apparently they've fucked this up royally. Now MJF and Wardlow, the only two guys that had never been on any major television before that AEW got over on their own. Actually, they got over on their own on the AEW program, despite the best efforts of AEW to keep them from getting over. And this is what you do with Wardlow. You're so creatively bankrupt, so mentally spent, so, you know, methamphetamine fucking addled that you would do this with a real legitimate star in the making and put him down to the level of these other fucking sewer dwellers, the pudding gang and pockets. Those are real phone numbers, by the way. Brian, if you if you have to bleep them, go ahead and bleep them. But that's what Wardlow, everybody in the locker room has at least one or two of those, some more. If I were you, I'd be getting a hold of them quickly, as quickly as possible, because your future in AEW is looking very, very dim. Your thoughts, Brian? Well, perhaps a call to Barry Bloom might be in order as well. I, think, I don't think Barry Bloom would answer it if he saw the first segment of Dynamite this past Wednesday. You know, there's a couple of different issues, and you touched on one of them. I won't even go... I'll get there in a second. The idea of Orange Cassidy being used in this match against Wardlow in this way. But like you said, what... If it was any other wrestler who's a babyface, 
Just slide any other baby face in there. What sense does the match make? Wardlow can't beat this other baby face. He could beat 20 security guards in a minute. He can't beat Orange Cassidy. But he can't beat this baby face. Who are the fans supposed to cheer for? How does Wardlow look better? I put two things on Twitter. One of them drove a lot of people crazy. I loved it. One of them was the booking of Wardlow since the MJF feud has been atrocious. And Les Thatcher responded and he said, that's an understatement. <laughs> and you know what? He's right. We said, I hope they don't mess up Wardlow. We said it time and time again before yeah. that match. I mean, unless they put a blonde wig on him, there's very few things they could have done worse than the way they booked him since the MJF match. It's almost two months now. He had a feud with Mark Sterling and security guards. And then eventually he got the Scorpio Sky. And then now we see him defend the title in the opening match <laughs> against Orange Cassidy. Who he beat. He beat Scorpio Sky in a third of the time and 10 times easier than he was able to beat Pockets. And Scorpio Sky is another full-grown adult human being, at least. I agree with you. It's ridiculous. And he's so much bigger than Orange Cassidy that it made it even worse, especially because he's a guy that you would think they're pushing. Now I wonder. As soon as they put the TNT belt on someone now, it feels like the opposite of a push. It feels like, oh boy, they're stuck with that belt now because it's been ruined the last, I guess, since the beginning of the year. You know, with Orange Cassidy, I drove people nuts because I put the truth. It's the fucking truth. Well, it's, it's observably a true. How can that even be controversial? What I put was AEW Dynamite was a lot better when Orange Cassidy was injured and off TV. And it was. He's been shoved on that show, and I get it. There are AEW fans that love him. There are fans who love Jimmy Fallon. They think he's so funny and so talented, and people like me see that shit and go, that shit is so lame and so soft and fucking garbage. Orange Cassidy, I've seen the whole act, and that's what it is. It's an act. I've seen the whole routine, the whole little slacker routine. Now he's got his new music. It's the same act. We've seen the same thing over and over again. It's not exciting to watch a guy who can do some moves and kick out of everything. Did anyone ever wrestle in someone's basement? I had a friend who had like a wrestling league in their basement, and we would go yeah. there and have matches. You kick out of fucking everything. Everyone's kicking out. No one's finisher means anything. Yes, because we're not finished playing yet. Exactly. This match was counterproductive to Wardlow to the nth degree. It was not counterproductive to Orange Cassidy. There's nothing that's counterproductive to Orange Cassidy. He just does his thing and ruins every segment he's a part of for a large majority of wrestling fans. But Tony likes him. He moves merch. He was in a segment with Wardlow to start the show, so I think that was probably the highest ratings of the show. So he'll be able to get some credit for that. As opposed well, that to, actually that counts for the Big Bang Theory, doesn't it? it? It would either count for the Big Bang Theory, or you would look at how many people dropped off after this segment. But no, man, Orange Cassie, we've seen it all. This is so tired and so lame. And the booking of Wardlow should disqualify Tony Khan from any Booker of the Year conversation at all. Just that. And the pops are less today than they were a month and a half ago. You mentioned nothing could be counterproductive to pockets. I'm one, we've got a creative audience out there. Can we come up with some scenario that would be counterproductive to pockets and try to pitch that as a booking suggestion? I, I can come up with one. He puts on a pair of trunks and wrestles like a wrestler. And acts <laughs> like a normal human being. He couldn't do that. Then he would just be another guy. He wears his sunglasses at night, and we can hope that he gets run over by the oncoming then, car. Like you hear some arguments from people like, oh, he's proved he can go. What? What does that mean? Who says that? Yeah, I mean, just he could do moves. Are there are fans who just want to see people run through the moves, the moves that people did in Japan years ago, whatever it is. They want to see people do lots of moves and kick out of lots of things. But there are some of us that are bored by that. And that Orange Cassidy is just a mascot for that caliber of wrestling. He is terrible you can train a chimpanzee to do the moves is he then understanding the psychology behind them well but no but pockets doesn't either because actually a chimpanzee might be more trainable than pockets because a chimpanzee wouldn't come in with a bad attitude thing oh, i know everything and one other thing i'll say they've been there a long time the best friends should not be on tv anymore as soon as i see them i groan and i always did but especially now it's like god damn why are they still there it's been years Send the Bushwhackers home. <laughs> well, I saw, then the, they went to break and Jericho and Kingston came back and they're still mad at each other and they're going to have some kind of blood match and Jericho's going to kill Eddie Kingston and 
Kingston's going to make Jericho pay with every ounce of his blood for giving Ortiz a crew cut and because Ruby Soho stuck her arm in a car door. That's what I got out of that segment. Then I saw a commercial, and I got this. I got some of the alien tape. Have you heard about this, Brian? The alien tape? Yeah, from the commercial, I got some of that too, yeah. Alien tape, it sticks permanently to any surface. It supports up to 100 pounds. I couldn't fucking unroll it. <laughs> anyway, then came <laughs> Moxley, the pl plumber Moxley. Boy, I wish plumber Moxley could have teamed up with Plowboy Frazier. Uh, plumber Moxley wrestled take a shit. And my honeymoon is over with old take a shit. Because now, thanks to folks digging things up on Twitter, as soon as I praised this guy, I said he looks like the only guy that I've seen, or the only person, male or female, that I've seen from that DDT Japanese mud show bullshit that actually looks like a wrestler and he has some size and he has some ability. I've now seen him doing doing the Harpo. That's what we're going to call it from now on when a grown adult alleged professional wrestler has a competitive match with a six-year-old girl doing the Harpo. That bothers me so much because I, I love the Marx Brothers. I have everything. I have every movie. I have every book. I love the Marx Brothers. And Harpo Marx is one of the most talented people he was. in the history of cinema. When you and compare these people to him... I know, but, and a lot of people have said that on Twitter. They've said, how dare you besmirch and diminish the name of Harpo Marx, but he looks just dead like him. Have you seen the people on Twitter who actually never have seen Harpo Marx and then Google him to find out what we're talking about and then blow snot because he does look exactly like Twinkle Toes? I've seen people react like that, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so <laughs> I've seen Take a Shit doing the Harpo with a six-year-old girl in Japan on video. So fuck this guy. He's another goddamn mental incompetent who wrestles kids and sex dolls. So I don't care how good he is. He's disqualified. Fuck him. And it, against Moxley, yes, they did the spot where they stand in the ring and chop each other back and forth. They fought on the floor. And Take a Shit got juice. In a cold match on free TV for no apparent reason. So we saw everything the plumber can do. And then here came Christian Cage and Dino Douche. And I've got to be honest with you, Brian. Until we start seeing Dino have full-fledged long wrestling matches again, Christian Cage has done the impossible and got Dino Douche over with me. Because if this had been what we were looking at all along, I could have seen some light at the end of the tunnel. I could have seen some blue sky with this guy. We started out watching this giant fucking goof in this dinosaur mask having 15, 20-minute indie-style matches doing backflips and cartwheels and those phony fucking-looking kicks that he has to do, and his matches didn't make any sense, and he's a baby face, which makes no sense, and he, it, he does a promo every once in a while, or he used to a few years ago, talking about being 35 million years old in a voice a little bit a little bit more stentorian than Keith Lee's, but kind of as grandiose because he wants to people to think he's a college graduate and that version of dino douche has sucked pond water but now he's all in black and he looks like a fucking beast and i think they've even made him tan a little bit more and he's still jacked up and now he's got a an obnoxious heel mouthpiece that's also a name star that everybody recognizes that's doing brilliant work and Dino becomes the fucking giant jacked up henchman behind the blabber mouth to do his evil bidding and destroy people in short amounts of time convincingly with no bat flips and no fucking stupid promos and no goddamn 20-minute high-spot matches where he's trying to wrestle like he weighs 117 pounds. If this is what we had seen first, I would have said you can make some money with this guy. 
apparently everybody else had already seen what Dino's normal matches and outlook on wrestling was like is why they just said, ah, fuck it. We're just going to let him do that. But this, this works for me. And Christian is doing a great job verbally and with his heel attitude. And he came out and blistered the poor old varsity blondes. Remember when there was a chance they could have done something with Pillman and that window closed, there was never a chance that they could do anything with Griff. Um, so Cage cuts the promo and then tells Dino that Griff looks like Jungle Boy, which is like raving, raving, waving the red flag in front of the bull. And Dino goes in and acts like a menacing monster and demolishes Griff with a choke slam and then another choke slam that Christian Cage calls for. And then the tar pit, which is his version of the snare trap and a tap out. Now I continue to wonder if jungle boy is injured and they just don't want to say because elsewise he ought to be on TV or visible somewhere. Like he's not just hiding in a hole, but at least. And before we talk about the afterbirth here and what they did wrong, this is working for Dino. That's what he should have been all along. What do you think? I agree it's working with him. I don't know if I think it's what he should be all along, because I think it means a little more because we have seen him, you know, again, too goofy for my taste, but we've seen him as a good guy before. Yeah, but everything I've seen of him up till now made me want to see less of him. This actually makes me want to see more of him. So I'm thinking if we saw this first instead of that, it might even be better. Let me ask you this, though, because since he's been managing, I guess we should say, Luchasaurus, Christian hasn't wrestled. I mean, I don't know what's going on in those other programs, Ab, but I don't think he's wrestled. What are they I doing with him? Because he's the one who attacked Jungle Boy, and now he's the one who has Luchasaurus. When Jungle Boy comes back, is it Jungle Boy Luchasaurus or Jungle Boy Christian, or does Jungle Boy have to go through Luchasaurus to get the Christian? Bingo. And see, that's the thing. They're smart enough to realize with Christian, and probably also because he said, hey, you know, I am 40-something years old, and, you know, what the fuck? They kept putting Punk in there for matches just to get ratings, just to get people to watch because it's Punk wrestling. He didn't need to because he didn't need to get get wins to get over. Christian Cage does not need to get wins to get over. He's already, he's been over 20 years. He needs to get some heat, and that's how he can do it, by talking and by having this behemoth to do his bidding for him. And when Jungle Boy comes back, that's the deal. He's, you know... You, Jungle Boy can prove himself by slaying the dragon, kind of pun there intended, but then money would be with Cage and Jungle Boy because Cage can talk and Dino can't. So Dino is a useful tool there to get to Cage and Jungle Boy where they can have a really good match and Cage can teach him something along with putting him over eventually. But there's no reason for Christian to be out there just wrestling TV matches to get over. That's what they, that's what they're supposed to do with guys that ain't over yet, that are new. But you know Tony's backwards philosophy on that. They'll come into company, you'll barely see them for a year, then they'll start wrestling on TV every week after they've already lost. Anyway, the point is they can't leave well enough alone because. Everything has to be chaos and everything has to be done to death. So after Dino demolishes Griff and beats him with the choke slam in the tar pit, then he shit cans Griff to the floor and, and jumps on Pillman. And that would have been fine too, except they've got to go out to the floor and he puts Pillman on a table and then grabs Griff Garrison and choke slams Griff Garrison on top of Brian Pillman, and the table didn't break. And besides the fact we've talked about it before, don't have your fucking heels doing cool shit that everybody applauds and go, wow, they did this last week or week before with somebody else where the fucking heel was doing cool shit. And everybody breaks tables. It's goddamn, it's way past done at this point. It would have just been more effective with what you're trying to do with Dino is if he beat Griff Garrison and fucking Brian Pillman Jr. came to check on his partner and he grabs Pillman by the scruff of the neck and choke slams him in the middle of the ring too and stands over both of them. 
but now you've gone out and you've set them on the table and you got this shop class project going on and now the physics didn't work because and i don't know why anybody didn't tell him this to begin with it's not like i'm they've just invented tables when you've got Bo brian pillman laying on the table his body laying flat uh, lengthwise on the table reinforces the table because it dissipates the weight of the blow of Griff Garrison's body weight coming down from all in the middle to spreading it out across the length of the table. Plus, Dino worked the first choke slam, at least on Griff's part. Poor Brian Pillman had to lay there for two of them. But he put Griff's shoulder blades on Pillman's belly slash dick and Griff's legs and ass was off the edge and just he bounced off and over off onto off the table onto the floor. If Brian Pillman's chest had been in the middle of the table and Griff landed back first with his legs up in the air, the table would have broken, but Brian would have landed on his head. And a splash by Griff Garrison, not coming back first, but stomach first, would have broken the table because the weight would have come down evenly and in the middle across Pillman, so maybe Dino should have gone for a vertical suplex and then dropped him flat into a gourd buster. Or just don't break a fucking table in every match. Because then not only did you have a fuck up on live TV where oh everybody knew instantly oh, I was supposed to break. Now you've taken them back into thinking about phony shit. If they had broken the table, the people would have cheered because they cheer table breaking. So then you're making the people cheer your fucking heels. So you're an idiot. But what they did then was Dino grabs Griff and does the exact same thing again, and Brian Pillman lays there and gets squished again stiffer this time because the, the second one was extra high and extra hard and all of Griff's weight on Brian Pillman. So it was needlessly stiff on him to get the table to break. And did anybody bother to tell you Dino dipshit. When you're on live TV, it's bad enough for the people in the building, but when you're on live TV and they can't even edit it, never do the exact same thing again after a fuck up because then you're just reinforcing to the people that are watching that you fucked up the first time. So they got all the way through this segment great, and then just because they had to break furniture, Shit the bed again. You see what I'm saying about this shit? They're, the psychology is completely off of everything. Because there is none. And I agree with you about the tables thing. And I think you're exaggerating a little bit. It's not every match, but it's at least once per show. Sometimes several times per show. And it's in the same area. It's the same table. And you know it's coming. I mean, forget about the fact that he messed up the first one. And everyone knew the second one was coming. Everyone knew the first one was coming. It's just so obvious and it's so overdone. Tables at ringside, guys going through them in AEW, is as overdone as standing in the middle of the ring and exchanging blows, either at the beginning or in the middle of a match. <sighs> and then... If... <laughs> Did you see Adam Page? It looked like they had just called him at home where he was in the middle of shampooing his carpets. And he just bopped on down to television. He had a house cleaning scarf on his head, a hair bun, and a tie dyed t shirt. He looked like the love child of superstar Billy Graham and Aunt Jemima. And he's back in the back again doing backstage skits with the Dork Order. They've just decided to forget that he was the world champion at all because it was such an underwhelming title reign. And now he's back dressing like a douchebag and talking and playing with underneath folks. And they're mad apparently at the house of black. So the house of black and the dork order are a, are a program that we're going to be treated to. How can a supposed cowboy look like such a fucking twat? Cause he's as much a cowboy as I am, but you can dress up like you can dress up like a fucking gangster or a cowboy. I'm not a gangster. A, I didn't mean to strike a nerve there, pal. I'm just saying you can dress up like anything. 
if you're if you're calling yourself something, then you should dress like that thing. I'd, uh, but that's not the attitude of the young bucks and their friends. It's we're here to play. We're here to do our little skits. We're here to have fun with each other. We think we have people who like it, so we're just going to do whatever we want. And if you haven't noticed, guys like Adam Page and the Bucks, they don't play well with others. So if they're going to stay within their little camp and the, them and the Dark Order will feud with the House of Black, <laughs> the House of Black are already death on TV. If you're going to put an Adam Page and the Dark Order in another death segment, eh, it doesn't make much of a difference. They spent a couple of years getting ready for Adam Page to be the world champion. When all those guys came in, you would hear them internally, they would say, oh, Adam Page is the one, Adam Page is the one. And they spent all that time, and everyone would say, oh, the thing with him and Kenny is so brilliant. And no one gives a shit about him today. No one gives a shit. <sighs> and it's not just because of the booking. This is not a case where you could blame Tony's booking as much as Adam Page. They gave him the belt, and somehow he got more Less boring. over. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow he got worse. I, I disagree with you about one that you can blame the booking for the complete disinterest in, in, I mean, both can be true. Page has done nothing except the same shit he does in every match. There's never any surprises, but the booking was abysmal as well. Yes. Yes. And then Jim Ross entered for hour two. Um, They've already... <laughs> They've already figured out a way to make this awkward. It was kind of a, okay, here comes Jim Ross, and he's fresh for hour two, and he's more cheerful, and it was a little upbeat thing last week. This week, the way they formatted it, they said, and ladies and gentlemen, Jim Ross, and the music plays, and he comes out, and he's headed to the announce desk, and before JR even sat down and said anything, they segued his music to Hager's music and here comes Hager down and then JR sits down at the desk and you hear him speak. It was an awkward transition. It's like, Hey, here's JR and he comes out and then something else is happening. And we never heard from JR until after that Hager entrance, it have him sit. If you're going to bring him out in the middle of the show, have him sit down at the desk and say 15 seconds of pleasantries and then segue. It's a less jarring transition. Jake Hader, Jake Hader. I hate Jake Hager. <laughs> Jake Hager versus Claudio Castagnoli. And I wrote, can Claudio make Hager acceptable? And well, the jury may still be out. Um, Claudio seems like he's having fun. He's got his oomph back. He, you know, was mistreated and beleaguered in the other place. JR actually opened up cheerful when the, we did hear him talk, and then his mic dropped out mid-sentence, and we missed his plug for his own, uh, Iowa appearance. But uh, again, with Claudio, I mean, he's got everything. And the only reason now that people are going, ah, but it's still Claudio, is because we've seen him for 10 years on the other program being used in the middle. But if anybody deserves a chance to be used commensurate with his ability, it's Claudio. He's got the size. He's got the experience. He's a hell of a worker. He's strong as a bull. And he's got some personality if you let him show it. So uh, Hager, on the other hand, his timing is off. His body language is awkward. And I don't really get the whole goddamn thing besides he's big and he was a shooter, so he's legitimate. Um, but th there was one point. Did you see where Hager, Claudio was up on a top turnbuckle and Hager pulled him off and had him over his shoulder and just turned around and belly to bellied him. And it scared me because Claudio put his left arm out to catch himself, which is dangerous. And that's also a sign that either he didn't know which direction he was going till he was already going, or he didn't feel like the guy that had, had him well enough to put him down in the right place. And after watching it back in slow motion, I think all of the above was true. But, you know, Claudio made a big comeback. He's got a great drop kick, great cross body off the top at six foot five and 260 pounds. He did the giant swing into the scorpion, had the scorpion on Hager, and Hager waves the job guys down. 
Like, it just... <sighs> I can understand the heel manager doing this. And I've done it. Where, oh shit, the guy's in trouble or the team's in trouble and the heel manager waves down reinforcements. But I've never seen a six-foot-something, 250-pound MMA fighter be put in a submission hold and instead of selling the hold he's leaning over waving job guys come and help me come and help me in the middle of a fucking submission hold but um so here comes the cool and luke and daddy mac mac daddy and danny garcia the rock sex and it it, it basically Claudio dropped the hold and just goes and looks at the guys and turns back to Hager and Hager hits him with a rock bottom and gets a two count. And then they start going back and forth and old cool hand Luke jumps up on the apron and Claudio nails him and then hits a pop-up uppercut on Hager and hits the sit-out powerbomb one, two, three. So as the right winner, it was a completely blah finish that wasn't even using the pieces of, of the chess game that were on the chessboard. And it was awkward, and it made Claudio look stupid when he turns his back on his opponent in the ring just to stare at people that are not doing anything. And again, this is possibly inexperienced booker or producers or whoever handles this shit. Think, well... We don't want the heels to interfere in front of the referee and bury the referee. Well, they should have had Knox out there for that. You can't bury the corpse. He's he's a zombie. But you don't have to. You still create some fucking excitement at the end. If, boom, when, when Claudio got the scorpion on Hager in the middle of the ring without him having to wave people down, aren't his friends watching? Here comes Luke and Daddy and Danny. And maybe as Claudio has got the fucking scorpion and he's cranking up, he sees the first guy, Luke, jump up on the apron and he lets go of the fucking scorpion to fucking nail Luke off the apron. And he turns around and Hager's still on the ground and Hager, as he goes to pick Hager up, Hager small packages him. One, two, but Claudio kicks out. And comes back up, which makes Daddy Mac come up on the apron. And there fucking Hager is coming, charging at Claudio. But Claudio ducks, and Hager can wipe Daddy Mac out with a big shot or a boot. Mac hits the floor. And then Claudio goes for a body slam, but Hager drops behind, goes for the O'Connor roll-up. Rolls up Claudio, gets one, two. Claudio kicks out. Hager goes head-to-head -head with Danny Garcia, who's up on the apron screaming at the referee. Hager turns into Claudio's kick to the gut and the fucking power bomb. Boom. Now we've got some up and down and up and down and people are taking bumps and there's some excitement instead of just bleh. What do you think, Brian? I don't think there's anything that could have saved this. I didn't see a lot of this. <laughs> I didn't see a lot of this because what I put on Twitter was you don't book Jake Hager in a singles match if you want me to stay in the room. Well, that's true. I don't think there's a single fan that wants to see a Jake Hager singles match. If he's standing in the back making his one face during a promo, you can kind of put up with it. He's a tall, big guy. In a tag team or multi-man match, okay, you need a big guy. But in a singles match, nobody wants to see Jake Hager. And I know a lot of people like Claudio, and I agree he's talented, hasn't done much for me so far in AEW. They put him with the Blackpool group, which doesn't do much for me in AEW, yeah. so... I'm not really crazy about it. I hate that everyone has to be in a faction. I hate that. We'll see where they go, but I think he has a ceiling too, especially right now. Well, speaking of the ceiling, they dropped this one, Anna, out of a helicopter and it crashed through the ceiling. There was an interview with Tony with Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm and Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter and Reba. And the whole point of this thing backstage was for Reba to bring in a sandbag to Britt Baker, who hands it to Tony and says, you carry her around for a month. And, and Thunder Rosa is screaming, I'll kill you for that or whatever. And they confused everybody that's not on Twitter. And is there any 
non kayfabe meaning is somebody put on Twitter for sandbag and for somebody to bring a sandbag in and make a big deal of the sandbag in the interview. When it wasn't even as we've discovered Thunder Rosa sandbagging anybody, it was the fact that Marina Schaefer is a drizzling fucking shits. But now they're doing sandbag interviews because they're cute and the audience will think it's funny. The 5% of the people that might be watching this program that would understand that. And then Serena Deeb wrestled Anna J. And then Tony Schiavone was in the back with Jane Cargill, Stokely Bivens, Malcolm Carmichael. What's his fucking name now? Stokely he, Hathaway. Stokely Hathaway. I, he's, he can talk his ass off. But he's stuck with Jane Cargill and the, and the baddies. And as soon as I saw who was in the interview, I wrote shit or bitch. That was the, what was the first cuss word I was going to hear in this promo from Jane Cargill. And immediately it was shit. That was the first word. Cut the shit, Tony. So, and it makes a lot more sense her doing it at the beginning, as opposed to when she's walking away. Well, it doesn't make any sense for her to do it anyway. Cause why just give people a free shit that means nothing for no reason on television? Use your shits more wisely. Uh, so Jane Cargill and Kira Hogan don't like the other girl who is an interim baddie that Stokely has put in there. <sighs> then they talked about the Ring of Honor pay-per-view with the matches that we all want to see, Jay Lethal versus Samoa Joe, FTR versus the Briscoes, that we can't see on AEW programming because it's too cluttered up with fucking comedy. Uh, but did you see who is getting a Ring of Honor World Championship match on Rampage on free TV? Well, it was this past Friday. We didn't watch it like everybody else. They gave Lee Moriarty a Ring of Honor World title match who's, against J Jonathan Gresham. Okay, I was about to say, who's the world champion right now? I'm not even well, sure. Well, exactly. It was Jonathan Gresham when they closed up, apparently. But so they're putting their trainee guys in world title matches on free television of ring of honor expect people to think that that makes that ring of honor is in any way a serious thing and then <laughs> jay lethal and sanjay dutt along with pinhead singe came to the announce desk and had to snatch jr's headset for the opportunity to cut a promo about their pay-per-view match for 20 seconds and because it was a headset microphone and nobody told Jay how to speak into it, and the levels are set differently. He was trying to use it like a regular microphone, and it sounded like it came from a NASA fucking radio broadcast from the moon. So again, we got 15 minutes of Plumber Moxley and the mascot, but we don't get FTR, we don't get Briscoes, we don't get Lethal, we don't get Samoa Joe, we don't get people we'd like to fucking see because they don't fucking fiddle fuck around playing grab ass tickle taint and sticky finger with the rest of the Hardly Boys' as fucking little school friends. Yeah, why are we getting more FTR? The fans chanted their names to the point where the Young Bucks couldn't even ignore it the other day. That, that's why we're not getting more FTR. Every time they let just crack the door a little bit, the people invite them in with open arms and spurn and scorn the Cucamonga kids, and they can't have that. Uh, then Tony was with Ty Cunty and Anna Jay, and both of them went to the Big Mama School of Acting. And then we got to the tag team title triple threat match. And this, thankfully, is the last of the uh, match of the program. And this is the one you just referenced, Brian. The, they set it up last week. Starks and Hobbs versus Swerve and Lee versus the Hardly Boys. When the Hardly Boys were trying to set this match up to determine who the greatest tag team in wrestling is, that's when the people started chanting FTR, as in, here's who we think is the best, here's who we'd like to see, but they weren't involved. You think they hear those chants when they go to bed at night? 
Because those weren't, we want to see you wrestle FTR. That was, we prefer FTR to you. We're sick of you. Do you think they hear those chants when they close their eyes? No, because I think they've got their Raycon wireless earbuds in, and they're not even a sponsor this week, folks, but it just came up. <laughs> Listening to the sock face call their greatest PWG matches from Reseda or Cucamonga or wherever they... Reseda. Wherever the case. Uh, that's what the Hardly Boys listen to, is people talking about how great they are when they go to bed at night, because that's why they have all these dreams that they really are. And of course, it wouldn't be a Hardly Boy match without the worst referee in the history of the business. I was about to say, I wrote Knox referee, this will suck. Hobbs and Starks, again, look great physically. They look great as a team. They're starting to do tag team maneuvers. They just don't get a lot of opportunity to show it, because you only see them wrestle every three months or so. I think I'm about over Keith Lee when I just didn't know anything about him and just saw his size and the way he could move. I was thinking, yeah, I could do something with him. But then I started hearing his promos and I started hearing him talk. And then I started realizing that this is probably the best he's going to be because he's almost 40. And I'm like, eh, eh. Anyway, um, in this match, which you couldn't watch most of it because it, this was, again, the kind of match that the Hardly Boys and their school friends used to have out in the fucking barn in Reseda or Cucamonga or wherever they all played with their friends. It just, over and over, shit, back and forth, stuff doesn't make sense. People in the match disappear for lengthy periods of time for no reason otherwise than it's not their turn for the spotlight. And guys just do shit to each other over and over. There's no heel. There's no baby faces. There's no logic. Nick Hardley and Swerve did an extended cheerleading tumbling routine at the start. And then they did a deal where Ricky Starks got involved in this too. He and Nick held their opponent's hands and then walked the top rope into each other and then argued with each other. Why? Blah, blah, blah. I, at one point, because I was watching this, you know, the the uh, studio out back is torn up and doesn't have any drywall in it. So Stacy was upstairs in the bedroom watching television while I was watching this in the TV room. And she comes down to take Harley out right at the time that old Matt Hardley gave Ricky Starks and Swerve both a double Northern Lights suplex. And she just looked at it and just burst out laughing and blew snot and continued on outside with the dog. The average person who's not only been a wrestling fan for 30 years, but has actually been in the business. If they want to tell the truth, they may not do it out in public because they want these two little street urchins to get them a job. But to tell the truth, they laugh at the young bucks because the young bucks are fucking funny. Not intentionally, but they're fucking funny. And then, somehow or another, they got Keith Lee and Powerhouse Hobbs, who were opponents, to do a double vertical suplex on old Mad Hardly, and boy, they put him down feet first, then ass, then whiplash. Uh, then they did some more indie-style shit and went to a break. Uh, Keith Lee made a big comeback. At least everybody fed him. Usually they don't bother to do that. Hobbs and Lee, uh, everybody else disappeared besides Hobbs and Lee. And they did their big man stuff. And then at one point, Hobbs knocked Keith Lee off the buckle and hit a frog splash two thirds of the way out in the middle of the ring and got a two count. That should have been the finish. If Hobbs can do that frog splash like that every time, he should never do it unless he's going to beat somebody with it. And that was the people got a big pop and you had some hope. Okay, Hobbs and Starks, out of the three of these teams, they should be the world champions. Well, it wasn't. And then everybody else in the match suddenly reappeared and the moment was lost. And then did you hear when Sockface, old excrement, said, the Young Bucks are one of the toughest tag teams in wrestling. 
That was a quote. Look, he's their boy. The reason he's there is them. And there's been numerous comments the last month or so. Remember when Jim Ross said FTR may be the best in the business and Excalibur couldn't even say that? Because he didn't want to upset the Young Bucks. But did, couldn't he say one of the fastest or one of the winningest or one of the most agile or... He's a dope. Whatever. He's a the, dope. He's a graphic saying, artist wearing a mask. He's a pack. dope. There's these two undernourished, smarmy, nerdy, conniving little Christian Lilliputians standing in the ring next to fucking Hobbs. And he said, they're one of the toughest tag team. Tough? Fuck. So then anyway, umpteen super kicks from the children. And then Hobbs bumps Knox. Not like you have to really anyway, but they did it. The Hardleys got one of the title belts, but Starks foiled them using it. Then Swerve got the belt, but then he dropped it on purpose because he didn't want to use it. But then Matt Hardley nutshotted Swerve and hit everybody with one of the belts and then covered Swerve. But that was a two count. So they, they even, they, they can't do finishes because they do fuck finishes and then ruin them forevermore because people kick out of everything because they have to overdo it all. So then they hit Swerve with their shitty little video game knee lifts, but Starks made the save. And then Keith Lee and Swerve hit a bunch of moves, and on, and then everybody hit a bunch of moves, and it all went to shit. And it way overstayed its welcome. <laughs> and then they were so going so long on time and overtime, my DVR froze again before the pinfall. I know what happened, and I'm about to reveal it, but they were down to the last 30 seconds of the show again, and Stacy said, you know, you can set it for an extra two minutes. I said, I don't, if they don't care about doing their job, I don't care about going out of my way to do mine. But they put the belts on Lee and Swerve out of nowhere. We said it on the show last week that wouldn't be surprised if Tony does that. Instead of putting the belts on FTR on the next pay-per-view like they should have to finish up this program, because right now, FTR, what tag team champions are they? Ring of Honor champions, right? Of a company that technically doesn't really exist anymore except in an LLC in Tony Khan's fucking portfolio. Right, Ring of Honor tag champions, about to have a two out of three falls match with the Briscoes, which we that, will be watching. Yes, that will be the rematch of the best tag team match of any company of the year. They are but, also the IWGP tag team champions. Which doesn't make a goddamn shit for anybody's business whatsoever. And the AAA tag team champions. Which doesn't make a goddamn shit for anybody's business whatsoever. AEW will still do the same business that they're doing right now that FTR are the AAA champions or not. And AAA, I'm sure, probably will also. New Japan Pro Wrestling, if they're going to do the same business, I'm sure their fans would like to see FTR, actual Americans that act, can actually wrestle, but it won't make any difference to AEW's business that FTR are the uh, New Japan champions. And... Again, Ring of Honor, Tony owns it. It's dormant right now. They're doing a pay-per-view. FTR could make those belts mean something with the quality of their matches and their defenses and et cetera, but since we won't be seeing those on television, just on pay-per-view for a company that technically doesn't exist anymore because Tony doesn't have the balls to get the Briscoes on his show, and or the fucking Hardly boys don't want that shit anywhere around them because it shames them and embarrasses them by comparison. So the only way to make it make sense for their business, for AEW's business, and to get this company with this television show over is to culminate FTR's winning the three belts that are meaningless in the overall scheme of things, the way the three belts mean something is aggregately all together. We've won this one. We've won that one. We've won the other one. We beat all those people. Now we're coming for the big one. And the showdown is would be for all four belts, the real world tag team title, which would be the AEW, even though 
even though the AEW World Tag Team title is not over either because it's been held for so long by goofs. But in this instance, that would be the way to get the title, the tag team title over and the people holding it. We're going to have this fucking match for all four of these titles, including the big one. And then the Hardly Boys would be expected to do what was right for business and put over the babyface team that even their all their fans are chanting for in the arenas. And that way, FTR would have all four belts, including the one set of belts that's important in this environment, which is the AEW belts. And the other three belts look good in pictures, and they look good in a in a as a a, a conglomerate of all these belts that the guys have won. But individually, those titles mean nothing. It was a a way to get to someone winning all four potential belts. But the Hardleys couldn't have it. They can't stand that FTR is better than they are. They can't stand that the people have recognized that. And they can't stand that they're getting backlash, not just from me now, not just from the listeners of this show now, but from a lot of people all over wrestling fandom and Twitter and the internet that said, we're tired of these fucking comedy children. We'd like our talent to be serious, to make sense, and to look like stars. You sound like some of the guys in the back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so instead of putting the belts on FTR on a big pay-per-view match, the big two out of the, the rubber match, it all fit. The rubber match. The baby face always wins in the end. The All the titles on the line. The people chanting for FTR. The way that FTR is doing work to expand... Tony's new projects like Ring of Honor. It all made sense to have the rubber match put the baby faces over and put all the belts on them. And oh, Matt and Nikki, they're so insecure and they realize what the fuck's going on and they can't stand it. This was supposed to be their play toy, their company where they could get all their untalented, cosplaying, trampoline cowboy friends jobs. And now they're being seen through. So they had to swerve, no pun intended, the belts out of the way of FTR. What they ought to do, old Maddie and Nikki, they ought to call old Kenny, old Twinkle Toes, and they ought to put out a, a call to Resida, to the barn out there, and they ought to find some more of their play friends that like to just wrestle until they get tired of doing moves. And that's what the pay-per-view match ought to have been. Put them all in the same match on the next pay-per-view. And put them all together so they can play with each other and stick fingers up each other's asses and grab each other's dicks and and use invisible force fields and just all and hand grenades and all that stupid phony bullshit that all of them and their friends used to do in PWG. And that way we could leave the, the rest of the pay-per-view for the real wrestlers trying to have real matches. So what do you think they're going to really do on the pay-per-view? If they're not going to have the tag team title match with FTR, so that means FTR is to do something different. What do you think the Young Bucks will do? I, I, who not? Probably get a bunch of their friends together and have one of their fucking little fucking... It's got to be Kenny, spot match. right? If they're not going to wrestle well, he's FTR... Up, though. He's he'll. He, he'll never be the same again after all of his injuries uh, that he suffered nah. wrestling children. You know what? He's piping off recently. We talked about it on the show. We embarrassed him when we talked about his stupidity and piping off on us. He's doing that for a reason. Watch him be at that pay-per-view. Watch him be the bucks in him at that fucking pay-per-view. You think he's trying to get some attention off of our, our audience and our reach because he's about to make his reappearance and everybody is... <laughs> pretty much not been calling for it because everybody's been happy that he's been gone and they didn't have to see him. I think they should be worried. We've been talking on the show about FTR being the better tag team for five years, six years, whatever it is. Everyone else has caught up to us. Everyone else is now realizing shit. Dax Harwood really is one of the best workers in the entire business. They well, really ca cash too. Very under underrated. Absolutely. But people are realizing they're actually good at tag team wrestling. They don't need to have a referee that turns his back on all the rules. They can work a brilliant match that gets the entire room going within the confines of the 
traditional rules of professional wrestling. And the fans have caught up to it. The AEW fans let the Young Bucks know that they prefer FTR. And these guys are all real sensitive. Kenny Omega. Uh, no. Kenny Omega, the Since Bucks, Adam up. Page. <laughs> these are the most sensitive people. And they can't deal with it. Adam Page couldn't deal with the fact that CM Punk was the star when he was the champion. Young Bucks can't deal with the fact that FTR are the better tag team and everyone knows it now. Kenny Omega can't deal with the fact that everyone hasn't accepted he's the best wrestler on the planet. But I think the interesting tale will be in the next few years. I don't know if you're going to read about it in The Observer, but there are a lot of people <laughs> who don't speak up about what they think about Omega and the Bucks because they're scared of any political fallback. That they'll be you know, and, and I screwed. gotta be honest with you. I've been in the business for a long time, and I remember when, oh yeah, you don't want to piss off Vince McMahon. Oh yeah, you don't want to piss off Jim Barnett. Oh yeah, you don't want to piss off Bill Watts. Oh yeah, you don't want to piss off any interchangeable mover and shaker in the business. But I gotta be honest with you. The the day that the time came in the wrestling business where anybody would be fucking concerned with what Matt or Nick Hardley or Harpo McFingerfuck says, does, or thinks about them, those flaming fucking unmassing guild pussies, that's a fucking embarrassing thing to say. That anybody, politically, personally, or otherwise, would be concerned with what those fucking little dweebs have to think about anything. You know as well as I do some of the behind-the-scenes shit that went on in Ring of Honor, and we've heard from people about what went on in New Japan with them, and we've heard from people with AEW about them. They're manipulators. They try to pretend like they're just, you know, hey, we're just doing this. They're manipulators, trying to get them and their friends over and trying to hurt and hold back anyone who's not along with them for the ride. And the stories will come out. The stories about Omega are the most fascinating fucking stories. The stories about guys fighting with him <laughs> in emails. The st there's so many Omega stories. I can't wait. Uh, the word douchebag gets thrown around a, a lot, lot. A lot. A lot. A lot. Multiple people have called him a douchebag to us alone. You know, Brian, if only these people had someone to talk to to run some of these things by before they go and say or do them in public... Maybe if the Hardly Boys had called up BetterHelp and said, hey, do you think we really ought to pitch a fit and make Tony put our tag team title belts on these other guys instead of FTR because we're jealous? Maybe a licensed therapist at BetterHelp could have said, no, what you need to do is you need to just get over your inferiority feelings and do what's right for your business and your employer. Maybe that's what they would have said. Some way or another, they could have given good advice to bad actors. And folks, if you're <laughs> not a bad actor or a bad wrestler, if you just have stress in your life, if you're burned out, if you need to take care of your brain, which, by the way, the rumor is, Brian, that you only get one brain for your entire life. You have to keep it. 95% of the people keep the same brain for their entire life. That's what I'm hearing. And how we take care of our minds affects how we experience life. So you got to keep your brain healthy, like learning a new language. Keep it nimble. That's like brain exercise or taking power naps. Keep your brain rested or better help online therapy. If you want to talk to somebody that can give you a, another viewpoint on what you're thinking about, you go to betterhelp.com and they offer Online therapy, video, phone sessions, live chat-only therapy sessions. You don't even have to get in front of a camera if you don't want to. More affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched up with a therapist in under 48 hours. Imagine if you could get everybody else that you need in your life in under 48 hours. Try getting a landscaper by Cracky. Anyway, and right now, our listeners are getting 10% off their first month services at BetterHelp. That's H-E-L-P. BetterHelp.com slash J-C-E. BetterHelp.com slash J-C-E. 10% off your first month services. I think I would even pay for the Hardly Boys first month services if they would just call and find somebody to talk to. Do you think it would actually help them, though? No, because... You have to be willing to help yourself before anyone can help you. And the Hardly Boys are helpless. 
but you can get help today with BetterHelp. That's right. Who, me? Anyone, including you. I was you. talking to you. Well, any of them. You or I. Any of us. Or together. Except these dimwits, the Hardly Boys. You can't help them because they don't deserve it. But everybody else does. That's everybody right. needs a little help. So go to BetterHelp, unless you're the Young Bucks. <laughs> unless you're the Young Bucks, and then just live in misery. <laughs> just be miserable forever. <laughs> we wish that upon you. All righty, I guess we got to keep moving with this thing. There was a SmackDown episode this past week on Friday night, July 15th, and there was a couple of teachable moments in this and a couple of things that had some element of entertainment, but for the most part, I mean, SmackDown, I guess, is a better show than Raw because SmackDown's two hours and Raw is three hours. Raw is like watching cheese mold. SmackDown, at least you know, regardless of what you get, it's going to be over quick, right? So, or quicker. But um, I told you, I said, there's going to be one thing that I'm pretty sure you probably wouldn't watch that I wanted you to watch because it could be a learning moment for some of the kids. And uh, hopefully you watched that match. Did you? If you are referring to Natty Neidhart and Liv Morgan, I did watch it, yes. Oh, boy, howdy. All right, we ain't quite there yet. Let's uh, let's start out at the beginning. Pat McAfee. And I guess this is where we're at in the wrestling business now, that an athlete from another sport who just happens to be a longtime fan of wrestling is actually now one of the best personalities in wrestling because there aren't very many personalities in wrestling, and Pat McAfee has one. He's a character like Mama Cornette used to say. It's not like he's playing a character. He is a character. And AKA, he's a real pill. He's a pill, that boy. He opens up with Orlando. It's an honor to be inside of you tonight. Um, And I mean, that's where we're at. We're looking forward now to the guys that do guest spots in wrestling because they're better at it than the, the people who are actually pros. Happy Corbin beat up McAfee last week, and now they're going to fight at SummerSlam. And again, McAfee, he's a wrestling fan with a personality. He's got a line of bullshit. He knows how to sell shit verbally. And he's, he's more natural at this than the guys on the roster. And I did not know that he and Corbin were football roommates so that adds something to after this promo that he did i i wrote i may actually want to see happy corbin and then suddenly happy corbin showed up on screen and proved me still wrong he looks horrible he looks like a tall bald drywall installer which mcafee pretty much said yeah and, <laughs> and, and it's it's observable truth and Corbin does the promo and says the words, but who cares? And there's not a lot of, he doesn't have much of a personality. And the reason why he wasn't there live in person is because he said he had what he thought might be monkey pox, but then it was that he's got a rash on his arm. I don't know what the fuck was going on there. I wouldn't want it to be around him either. Ask for a settlement. Yeah. And then McAfee said he faked monkey pox because he's scared to be there. Right, and then McAfee introduced Liv Morgan. And we went quickly from the sublime to the ridiculous. But before we talk about this match, just again, Pat McAfee, he's only had, what, two matches? He's he's a fan who gets it better than the guys get it. What do you think? I wish he was a wrestler more than a commentator. I get his strength as a commentator to some, but he's such a personality and he's good in the ring. Why isn't he wrestling full-time or, you know, for what they have as full-time? Well, anyway, so we'll look forward to seeing McAfee pop up at SummerSlam. But then the match that we've all been waiting for. So there was controversy on the internet last week. Liv Morgan and Natalia had a match at a house show somewhere. And the 15-second clip was going around. Liv Morgan hits her finish and pins Natalia. And Natalia immediately rolls up on her knees and points her finger at Liv. And I said, I can hear the words, that's the last fucking job I'm going to do for you coming out of her mouth from the appearance of the body language. 
Apparently, it wasn't the last job she'd do for Liv Morgan. She did another one here, but there was consternation on the internet. Well, is this unprofessional? And I told a story about, you know, when I've seen guys the same thing, and somebody even tweeted a, a link to a match in Houston with Buddy Landell and Sonny King. And I retweeted that out, and and said you can tell that Buddy wanted to have this match about like he wanted to be circumcised with a bottle cap. And, you know, that sometimes things just don't work, right? But I figured, okay, I'm going to watch this match and see if they've got their problems smoothed out or if there's anything I could see that might lend some kind of understanding to what was going on between these two. And this match pretty much told me everything I needed to know. Poor fucking Natty. If she's been having to do on-the-job training with this girl like this in every match they've had, I can understand why one would lose one's patience. What'd you think of the match? <laughs> well... I went into it with a little bit of a jaded view just from the glee you had when you told me to watch it. It was all right, but it's two people working two different ways completely. One is trying to work a match. One's a wrestler. And the other one has little movements that she's memorized that she does at different times. Sometimes they hit. Sometimes, I don't know what she was even trying to do at one point. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Here's the thing. Natty Neidhart grew up around the wrestling business. She's got it in her blood. She's experienced. And I was looking at both of, not only the way they worked at each other, but what just both of them individually did. From the opening, Natty slapped her. And it was a perfect work and slap. She didn't take any liberties. Um, Natty's doing, a, she moves her weight around cause she's not a, a, a frail girl. She's got some weight to her, but she's an athlete. She moves it around smoothly, easily nip ups, up and overs. And she's got her basics down. Liv Morgan. She's, it, it, she was doing weak shoot offs. This girl is 40 pounds heavier than she is. And she'll just out of a headlock. She'll just fling her head in a direction expecting Natty to run 20 feet that way. There was at one point, uh, she got to kind of live, did semi lost on a drop kick spot, which ended up stiff. Yeah. She's laying those drop kicks in. Um, Liv Morgan tried to roll up and landed on her head, then got the second roll up. When Natty kicked out, Liv rushed a drop kick while Natty was still getting up, and not only was she still on her knees, but she wasn't up on her knees and ready to take a shot in the chest, leaning backwards so she could brace herself. She was on her knees still getting up, and Liv rushed the drop kick and kicked her right in the tits and the gut, and Natty had to fall back and sell her face. And then uh, Natty tried to put Liv Morgan and a sharpshooter on the apron and Liv Morgan rushed a weak kickoff and Natty had to kind of half stagger back into the post herself. And then she did a perfect boomerang into the post to Liv Morgan. But then it, just all of this is like with the, the sharpshooter thing and the kickoff, it reminds me of a bobble that you see a lot of times when guys are trying to kick off out of the figure four. And it depends. Sometimes guys will do a figure four and the object is to try to spin into it as quickly and as smoothly as possible, right? And be impressive that you got it that fast. And then sometimes there's a reason you don't want to spin that fast. You want to pause a little bit. If you, let's say you, you can envision Flair with his opponent laying on his back and Flair's got the guy's right ankle in his left hand and he's saying now we go to school right so obviously when you've got the guy's right leg in your hand you take your right leg and you step over it and you're spinning to your left to go into the figure four when you go all the way around you bend the right leg behind your knee you throw your right leg over the top of that foot and you sit down on it you got your figure four 
But sometimes, and especially the old timers would do this, and Flair would do it a lot, when he would step over the leg with his right leg, he would plant his right foot and pause for a second and then take the guy's leg and wrench it sideways and continue his spin to the left to put the figure four on. Not only did that make it look more violent with the movement he was making twisting the guy's leg, but it establishes that he pauses when he steps his right foot over. Because that's the point where if you're going to get kicked off out of the figure four, you get kicked off there. So sometimes you'll see guys that knew what they were doing. They'll spin into the figure four real smoothly and quickly. If later on in the match, they're going to be countered into a small package, then there shouldn't be a pause. It should be quick. And the opponent getting the figure four applied to him took advantage of the guy's momentum to bring him on over in the small package. But if later on in the match, you're going to try a figure four where the guy's going to put his foot on your ass and kick you off into the turnbuckle, you step over the leg and put the foot down and pause for a second and wrench the leg so everybody has in their mind when it gets foiled later that you do that pause naturally. You see the difference? Yeah. So to get back to Liv, she's not waiting for any of these things. She's just doing it whether the the person is set for it or not. And that's timing and that's experience and that's getting a flow to your work that a lot of these younger people that don't have the repetitions and I haven't been in the ring with a lot of experienced people are not doing. But again, again, Liv Morgan is 40 pounds lighter and she's working even. There's no extra oomph in her shoot-offs She's rushing things. And her comeback in this match was seven windmill wild punches that Natty just covered up for and couldn't sell because they were coming everywhere and most of them weren't landing. And then three straight rapid fire kicks before Natty could bump because she's got to do the, I'm going to kick you here, kick you there, kick you the other place thing. And then as Natty bumps into the ropes and she's hanging there on the ropes like for a position for a 619, here comes Liv Morgan again with that double-footed drop kick to the small of her back as she was leaning face first against the ropes. And then she pulls Natty out of the corner into an awkward small package variation because she didn't know how to do the small package and pulled her down on her head for a shoot. Then they did a reverse shoot-off spot where Liv Morgan pirouetted going into the ropes because she wasn't sure if she was supposed to be running at that point and tried to hit some kind of move and missed it so bad that the announcers went, oh, because they didn't even know what it was. And then she tried to kick Natty off from that and Natty had to stand up and get her feet under her and run in place. And then they did a spot where Natty put Liv Morgan up on the top turnbuckle and went for a superplex, and they're struggling to for the position, right? Like they were working. But then it looked like they changed their minds midway because Natty had already put Liv's legs on the outside of the buckle, and then they fiddle-fucked around for a minute, and then she turned around and put her legs back inside the buckle and had her drop down underneath her and pull her off the fucking turnbuckle. And I... I Finally, Natty hit a great power bomb, got an ankle lock. Liv Morgan rolled through. Natty went to the buckle. Liv hit some kind of move and hit her finish off the ropes and pinned Natty one, two, three. And I can fully see it being a struggle working with Liv Morgan now that I've paid attention. They certainly tried to play off the video that got out there. There was a lot of pointing earlier in the match. <laughs> The pointing was the best part because Liv Morgan can point. She just can't well, Natty have any did, contact. Natty does the pointing. I was surprised they did apron spots. What Was that necessary here in this match? Uh, I'm just uh, so for all the people who were like, oh, you're giving Liv Morgan a, a bad break here. You know, no, no. Natty was unprofessional. No. If anybody that knows what they're fucking doing had to work with somebody that was working like Liv Morgan was working like I saw in this match, 
after a week or two, they'd get fed up too, is all I can tell you. I'm sorry if that hurts anybody's feelings, but what do you want me to do, lie? Anyway, did you love our boy Austin Theory and Paul Heyman trying to sell him the used car? And what they're trying to do is because I think they have recognized that by necessity for a main event for SummerSlam, they have to go back to Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. And for a lot of their most devoted fans, they're going to be the ones saying, well, what the fuck? Same thing, right? So they've interjected theory into it with the theory that he's going to cash in his briefcase and either Roman Reigns is going to kick shit out of Brock Lesnar so bad or Brock Lesnar is going to kick shit out of Roman Reigns so bad that they'll be vulnerable and then Theory can come and cash in, which, you know, it's it's a way to, to put some kind of intrigue or question into the finish of the match as far as it doesn't have to be either guy coming out as the champion after the show. So I see what they're doing there, and it's good to to have Theory in the main event mix with guys like this, and it's also good that he didn't fall for Paul's sales pitch because they're not booking him to be an idiot. The question is whether it does him good to, for even people to have the idea that he just wants to capitalize on a wounded opponent because he can't do it on his own. Is that the way to get a guy over to that level? But since he's a heel, there's some, there's some wiggle room there. But the point is, especially in the first altercation here with Paul, Paul comes out and does a brilliant job of trying to sell theory on the reasons why he shouldn't cash in with Roman Reigns, because we can't just give away something like this on the spur of the moment with no notice. Leave everything to me. I can get you a major championship match and a main event pay-per-view with all the money and the attention and the publicity. And Paul builds that whole thing up and in theory listens to him and then says, well, maybe I'll need us. And then, you know, Paul says, let me handle everything. And, and then theory says, maybe I'll need a special counsel after I beat Roman Reigns and hire you. And so they're not making him look stupid at least. And the, the theory intervention or involvement is kind of like a red herring or a MacGuffin to add an extra twist to the title rematch. But I'm just glad at least he's not saying, oh, okay, Paul, anything you say, and look like a dipshit like they make everybody else look like. But this was the first segment where Paul tried to get Theory to do what he wanted, and he wouldn't. So then later on, let's go ahead and bring the two parts together. Heyman interrupts Mosh Pit Jones, who now I guess we're going to have to call him Moss because I've refused to call anybody madcap, but he stopped dressing like an idiot. And he's a great looking athlete and he might actually have a future away from happy Corbin. So we're not going to call him mosh pit, but Heyman goes to Moss and does the exact same promo word for word almost, but altered slightly to fit the picture here to instigate Moss to take Theory out in their match tonight so that he can get a title match with Roman Reigns on a big pay-per-view with the money and the publicity and exposure and etc. And Moss blows him off too. So Paul was great in this thing, but that's the, you know, that's the the gist of what they're doing with Theory's involvement. What did you think of these interactions? It was all right. But again, I go back to what I said before, the show long booking a theory, and this ties into that, was, to me, kind of puzzling. In what way? He came out of it looking really weak, I thought. I thought the whole show kind of built to him looking like a weakling and leaving. I don't know. Uh, hold on here. Wait a minute. Did I, did I forget something? Because, uh, well, here's the thing. Theory disappears at the end, but everybody disappears at the end. Kind of got you his know ass. everybody disappeared. Well, he got his ass kicked and he got thrown over the rail. That's how he disappeared. Oh, that's right. Moss came back and beat him. <laughs> uh, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, you're right. I was looking ahead to my notes. I've slept since then. Yeah, he ended up looking like an idiot. Well, I was reading my contemporaneous notes. All right, skipping ahead. Uh, did you like the part where Walter Gunther is now browbeating Ludwig for losing and screaming at him in German, and he punishes him with a chop? He takes his coat off and chops him to punish him. Anything that makes Walter look bad, badass, I mean, like bad. Um, what about old Lacey Evans? Yeah, what Can was this? Can you explain this one to me? No, what was this? We had just seen her on TV for a few weeks. You started reviewing it, then I got to see yeah. it, where she was doing this very inspirational, I hate to use the word gimmick, she was talking about her real life, apparently, the tough road to getting to where she is in life. <laughs> and they had her on TV, and they were trying to get the fans to cheer her, and apparently we, we missed a lot last week. Well, I remember for a few weeks now that somebody's been saying the rumors they're going to switch her heel. And I'm like, wait, what are you talking about? She had an abused childhood. She was a high school wrestler and a Marine with honors that overcame this horrible upbringing. And, and she's going to be a heel. And I'm like, what in the French fried titty fuck is going on here? And now uh, she's gone so far because... All these things she said was true. And she was a, you know, Marine with honors and all those things. But now because the fans are not respecting her enough and not giving her standing ovations, now she's disgusted with them. She, they're not giving her the respect she deserves because she's an American hero and the fans can go to hell. And, <laughs> and she blows off her match with Aaliyah because they're not giving her the proper respect. She said, I overcame obstacles that would crush the average American. So again, she's a good heel. She's got heel attitude. She's doing the promo. She's not bad at that. She's certainly not as amateurish as most of the girls are at speaking in any company these days. But the build got to hear, I don't... The fans started wanting her because when she was saying all those positive, you know, true, sad things, you couldn't what that because it was, you know, poor form. It would have been rude. But now she's being a heel, and now they're like, well, what the fuck? We went through all this shit just to hear her switch heel. Now they're wanting her to death because she was forcing it. And trying really hard and told the fans to go to hell again. But I'm I'm amazed. It, it's <laughs> they spent weeks and weeks having this girl tell all these horrible true things about her upbringing and her background and establish her as a patriot and a service member and all this other stuff, and then decide, and now the next obvious logical step is for her to hate everyone who's not giving her the respect she deserves and switch all that heel. I don't get it. I assume you didn't get much of it either. I don't know what to think of it, no. Anyway, then we... we and Drew McIntyre did something with somebody. And then Austin Theory shows up again against old, the formerly known as Mosh Pit. And like I said... <laughs> Moss is looking and dressing like a real person now, and what a fucking physique, and he looks like he knows what he's doing. Can they not lose his first name? We lost Austin. Can we not lose Madcap? Just Moss. <laughs> There's lots of but, Moss in WWE. <laughs> boy, it, it grows on every side, not just the fucking north side of things. Um, or is that mold? I forget. The, anyway. So, old Moss is Steiner strong. He can move people around. And both these guys looked great. They didn't rush. They have nice timing and basics. Their shit looks good. You know, they had a nice match. And uh, at the end, Moss made a, a comeback. It was a little wobbly, but a lot of fire. And the one thing, did you see the spine buster? That scared the shit out of me. Moss either shot him off or caught, caught Theory coming off the ropes 
and boosted him up over his left shoulder and then turned left for the spine buster. I have never seen that before, and it scared the shit out of me. And I guess, you know, this guy, Moss is strong enough. If he's comfortable with it, then I guess, okay, but that could be trouble. I I was astonished. And I wonder, has anybody mentioned that? Well, I guess if they train with him, they've seen him do it before in training and know that he could, but I... He came out of NXT. Well, but I mean, you know, Hulk Hogan used to do a vertical suplex and he'd hook the guy's head with his right arm, which was completely bizarre and unheard of, but it was comfortable for him. So if they think it's not going to be a problem, but I wouldn't want to fucking take it. That would be disorienting and, and somewhat, like I said, bizarre anyway. Um, uh, but did you notice during this match, during most of the matches, the crowd is dead. Even the fake crowd, even the fake audio is just dead. Um, nobody's cares cause they've made the matches unimportant. You know, that is one thing you did not say during the AEW review. It was true there too. Their crowd, what was it? Savannah, Georgia. That crowd was dead also. Well, you know, normally the AEW fans, for what they're there for, they like that kind of shit. But remember, I said Savannah's a hard town. I said, good luck to them drawing. I guess they drew four or 5,000 people, but Savannah's never been the hotbed of wrestling. Anyway, back to Theory and Moss. So they go to the floor, and Theory hits Moss with the case and gets disqualified. And that's another reason why people don't care anything about the matches, because it just happens like that often and so then theory beats up moss with the case two or three times hits him and just walks to the entrance and gets the microphone and cuts promo about how he'll soon be the wwe champion but then out comes sammy Zayn and takes issue with him disrespecting roman reigns and the bloodline and i'm like who are the heels here yeah, this got so weird. And by the way, the way it ends, if you want to call that an ending, is even weirder because it's like, oh, oh, we're just going to keep moving here. This whole thing was really, really weird after the match. Well, can't stop and grieve forever, but... <laughs> um, so Zane, uh, the heel, is now mad at Theory, the heel, because Theory, the heel, is disrespecting the bloodline who are heels. And at the same time, Theory beat up Moss with the briefcase, then walked a hundred yards away, got the microphone and started talking and you never saw Moss. So Moss let a guy beat him up and walk away a hundred yards away, still in sight. And you can still hear him and never did a goddamn thing about it until Sammy Zayn brought out the Usos, which scared theory back to ringside so that then Moss, who'd been sitting there with his dick in his hand, apparently, could jump on him and beat him up now that he gr was gracious enough to come back to Moss. <laughs> Moss got the shit kicked out of him, but it didn't make him mad enough to go after the guy that did it. But when the guy comes right back next to him, then he'll fight him. So now, Moss beat Theory up, and you were right, I forgot about that at the end. And the Usos, who were brought out by Sami Zayn because Theory was disrespecting Roman Reigns, get in the match and don't care that he disrespected Roman Reigns now because Moss has beaten him up, so they just got in the ring. Yeah, they just get in the ring and, like, nothing is going on. They just, ding, 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 the next match, here it is. They just go right into the match. And that, by the way, we've never seen anything like this before. One of the Usos against one of the, the Street Profits. Holy mackerel, how in the world did they come up with that revolutionary bit of booking? We've never seen these people interact with each other before. So they had a match out of that, and as a result of that, at the tag team match at the pay-per-view playa, the special referee is going to be, according to Adam Pierce, who's found the perfect referee, Jeff Jarrett. I like Jeff. Jeff's a friend of mine, fan of Jeff's work and his talents as a promotional person. 
have you ever, when you were looking it through the mental Rolodex you keep, Brian, in your mind, have you ever thought of Jeff Jarrett and said, well, here's a perfect special referee. For what fucking purpose? I did, I, I, I'm not saying they shouldn't bring back for the pay-per-view, they, they shouldn't bring back Hall of Famers or Legends or whatever. But he wasn't even there on the show. They just showed a package that they already had done. Nothing happened that would make Jeff Jarrett the perfect referee for this match. He's just refereeing. Yeah, and according to that video package, nothing happened after 2001 either. Well, that's I know I, I saw a couple of clips in there hidden, but I didn't get it. I didn't get the idea of the referee. I mean, I don't think it's the craziest thing. If they want to do a special guest referee thing, and you're going based on A, it being in Nashville, and two, which of the agents will actually pop the <laughs> audience? Yeah, I could see it working. I mean, it's, I mean, no one gives a shit about this feud. Why? Why not? Why not? <laughs> all right, all right. I I was going to suggest other ways that Jeff may have interjected himself somehow, but why? It was it was weird though. Adam Pierce like you. I'm a special referee, and here he is, and they just play like a video for minutes, just go on and yeah. on and on. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I got the perfect special referee for you. Fucking Tom Petty and all the heartbreakers. I... Anyway, uh, who's refereeing Brian over at the Arcadian Vanguard Network on all the programs that you're producing and or airing this week? Oh, another big, big week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcast or on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. Check out the latest episode of the Mid-Atlantic Championship Podcast with Mike Sempervivi and Roman Gomez out right now reviewing Mid-Atlantic Wrestling early 1983. We are on the road to some big things in 1983. Check it out today. MidAtlanticPod.com or of course look for the Mid-Atlantic Championship Podcast wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Jim, the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review is getting ready for 1984 right now. A lot uh -oh. of big things coming up. Me and Mike Mills have reconvened. We've got a bunch of stuff that's going on right now. New episodes coming very, very soon. The latest one just went up. But early 1984, if you don't mind me asking you, because Mike and I were just talking about it, what do you remember about the TV taping where you and the Midnight Express tarred and feathered Magnum TA? <laughs> and also... Later on, as a booker, as a promoter, when you did tar and feathering kind of things, is that angle there the reason why you knew never to do it in the ring? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Only if that's the last thing you're doing with that ring that night. Yeah, the TVs, uh, when we first went to Shreveport and started doing the Mid-South TVs, it was like, it was my, obviously, my first experience with doing television in a completely different territory that wasn't even an offshoot of Memphis. For example, you know, the Georgia TV in the summer of 83, it was with all of our Memphis guys and in a Chattanooga TV studio with an old Memphis TV announcer, Michael St. John. So this was completely different. And you could tell that there was some element of malaise at the end of 1983 that, you know, the talent wasn't quite in the right place yet. And the matches didn't have a little bit of a spark yet, but as soon as all the new guys got in and got settled and the old guys that were staying had to step up their game a little bit by the first few TVs of 84, the things were cooking and the fans were starting to get a little more into it. And we got a ton of heat with that tart and feathering deal that night with not only the people in the building, but also the people that saw it on television. I've mentioned that actually some of the fans tracked down Bobby Eaton's car at the hotel he was staying at the week after that aired and tarred and feathered the car. So it, it started registering. <laughs> it started registering. How did Magnum deal with it? He didn't know what to think because he had... Well, think about this. He grew up around the Carolinas and he had started down in Florida and wrestling was a little 
straighter laced in those places, and they had ne he'd never seen an angle like that. And he thought, aren't they going to laugh at me? And I mean, I didn't tell him anything because it wasn't my place to at the time, but Dundee had to explain to him, not by the time we get finished and not by the time that they, the heels start crowing over it and bragging about it and not by the time. You had to explain because he was new. And you even see when he does the interview, he was so scared that people were going to laugh. He said, some of you out there may find this remotely humorous, but this is insulting. <laughs> yeah. Well, to, and, it's the first time he actually gets fired up in a promo in Mid-South. That's the first yeah. time you hear him fired up, and he's been there for yeah. a while. And he didn't have to worry about people laughing at him because Bill Watts was dressed like Buffalo Bob next to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what an outfit he had on that taping. But, like, to your but, point... But the thing. Once, once that he saw that not only did nobody laugh at him, that they were actually physically assaulting us for doing it to him, then he said, okay, now then he started to learn the bigger picture of wrestling, where it wasn't just doing the moves right, it's making the people feel a certain way. Go ahead. You know, to your point before, and then we'll move on with the plug, <laughs> towards the end of 83, September, October, it got really dry. Not that there weren't talented people there, but it got really dry, got really kind of slow. Not just the wrestlers, the TV, the booking. That first taping of 1984, like the episode I'm talking about, which is uh, commonly called, I think, January 14th, but obviously the date floats based on where it aired and when right. it aired first. It has you guys tar, tarring, I guess tarring, tarring and feathering Magnum TA. And of, and of course, by the way, for anybody who thinks we actually used real tar, no, the tarring and feathering comes with Cairo syrup serving as the tar. Also, you guys had a match. So there's two segments right there. People are ready to kill you by that match because of what you did earlier. Then we get the promo from TA and 2 with Bill Watts. So a lot of things are covered. We also have a match from Neidhart and a match from Butch Reed, who had just broken up. So you have that going on in those two matches. And then the other thing is the Russians versus Duggan and the Dog. And this is when Terry Taylor debuts. And think about it, You guys got pushed right out of the gate bigger than any tag team we've seen in the couple of years we've been reviewing shows. They bring in Terry Taylor off a couple of music videos. Right away, he confronts the Russians. And right away, he's with the Dog and JYD. Yeah. So Watts really was going to put a rocket to him, too. Well, and and uh, obviously, and that was Dundee was booking, but with Watts's, you know, approval and uh, obviously, you know, putting in little polishing things wherever he could or whatever. But it, it, that's not revolutionary booking. <laughs> he, you, you don't bring new talent into a territory if you want to use them in a main event position without having them get win after win on television on a near weekly basis and then involve them in with other main event talent where that the new guys come out looking like they're every bit competitive or comparable to the people that are already established as main event stars. That's not revolutionary booking. That's the way you're supposed to do it. And when you do it with talent that can produce like they did with the Midnight Express myself or Terry Taylor or later on with the Rock and Roll Express or, you know, a few of the other guys, obviously, that already done it with Dog and Duggan, et cetera. It works. And it works big. And they had a record business year. But it's not like that that was something revolutionary that nobody else has ever done. It's a modern thing for top stars to debut on TV and either lose or be comparable with underneath talent because they don't want to hurt their feelings by not giving them a good match. And therein is also a byproduct of why things don't draw anymore and people don't care about wrestling. Well, we'll be talking a lot more about 1984 Mid-South, I'm sure, but it is interesting. You know, you guys debut on TV towards the end of 1983, a couple tapings later, Terry Taylor debuts. The next taping, Buddy Landell returns as a heel for the first time. He'd been a undercard babyface there. And then the Rock and Roll Express start getting mentioned. So it's fun watching the rollout, and we'll be covering it. MidSouthPod.com, or look for the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. 
And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. That was for you. I tried to do something nice for you, and you hit me with the, what is that? Spring? That's, that's, is it a that's spring? A spri- the spring is sprung. Well, spring has sprung and summer has leaked. I don't know where we're going, but go through the archive today at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The 605 Super Podcast. The Mothership! <laughs> you got caught me unawares. All righty, and now we've got some special content because we got a present this past week. You and I both, a fellow named Mike Richardson, contacted us on Twitter and had found some of the old Weasel's World of Wrestling, um, can't even call it a newsletter, sheets, literally sheets, that, uh, that Norman Dooley, my old friend, the inventor of the star rating system, uh, did uh, back in the day and we've talked about this and we're not this is not a uh, hit piece on uncle dave Meltzer. he has actually admitted this and said this and talked about norman dooley and talked about norman's newsletter and how that he took the star ratings from norman and how that he took other things and you can see when you go back and read these sheets see some other things he took from Norman, but he's admitted that and we've talked about it back before Dave lost his mind and decided to stab all of his old friends in the back in order to stay in good with the cool kids. We've had a discussion about Norman. And the thing is, a lot of people are going, well, why is this a revelation now? Cornette, you've got everything you've ever owned, especially related to wrestling. And this is a very weird story because Norman Dooley, as I mentioned, he's from New Albany, Indiana. He was a fan in the late 70s and the 80s. Friend of mine, we met, and we'll talk about that, uh, through wrestling and Norman being another, to my knowledge at that time, the only other smart fan in the city of Louisville, Kentucky, that was corresponding with other fans from different parts of the country, sending results and programs around. It was me and him, basically. And... The weird thing about this is, Brian, I've told you the story. I've mentioned it before. But Weasel did all the results for all the matches around this area, both the Mid-Atlantic matches in Cincinnati and the Bruisers shows in Indianapolis. He used to go to St. Louis all the time to see matches at the Keel Auditorium, and he was always at the Louisville Gardens. And sometimes he'd take trips with me to other matches in the territory. And... He did these uh, typed up, just legal sized sheets. That's where really uh, newsletters got called sheets in the early days because everybody who did them just typed them up and got that sheet of paper Xeroxed, as we used to say, copied. Now, I remember they were copies were three or four cents a piece when I was doing bulletins back in the in the seventies, but. You could get the legal pad size copied for five cents and you got more room. So it came out more economical. When I ended up moving back into the castle 20 years ago after my mom passed away and we had remodeling done and everything, we had cleaned the house out and taken everything over to the place I was living across town at the time. And then the work was done and then we moved everything back. And here at my mom's house, I've mentioned she was a pack rat like I am. She still had all of my wrestling collection and all of my comic book collection. Everything that was in the house had still been here, except stuff I had taken with me on the road and when I lived in Charlotte and then in Connecticut and et cetera, various wrestling collectibles. And I'd picked up a bunch more stuff at that time. Finally got it all together back in this house, everything that I owned and still for years never had time to unpack anything. Finally, in 2013, when I took a year off after the Ring of Honor fiasco almost gave me a goddamn heart attack and brain aneurysm, one of the things that I did was go through all the boxes of old newsletters and results and clipping sheets and my notebooks from Louisville, and I did the Tuesday Night at the Gardens book on Louisville wrestling based off of my firsthand notes from 74, 75, and that era, along with 
all the clippings that I had collected and and etc. And I did a first half of the 70s book on Louisville wrestling. But I was looking for the rest of my notebooks, and I had 76, 77, 78, 79. But then 1980 through 1982 was gone. I had no Weasel's Worlds. And because Weasel started typing the stuff up, and I was keeping handwritten, just, you know, spiral notebooks, jotting things down on the fly at the matches, I said, well, fuck, I'll just use Weasel's sheets because he's typed everything up where I can read it good and the times and everything. They're gone. The only thing that I can figure is that there was so much stuff. When, when I moved from Connecticut back to Kentucky, and this not even counting my mom's house full of stuff, the movers said that it was one of the heaviest private homes they'd ever moved because of the amount of books and tapes and paper and documents. Then I put all that together with everything that was in my mom's house. I've got everything except any of my notes or any of Weasel's World newsletters from 1980 through 82. And then it got stranger because we started going back, and you've tried this, Brian, and I've talked to a number of people. I still know people that are still living that were pen pals and correspondents of Norman Dooley's. And every time you go to them, they say, well, a flood happened, or I moved, or something happened. Nobody has these fucking sheets. And I mean, Weasel, he had at the time, you know, 30, 40, 50 pen pals and names that, you know, we, we remember from being friends and meeting at the wrestling conventions. Nobody can find these fucking sheets. And nobody has seen Norman Dooley in over 20 years. And people have been looking for him, especially as he's gotten talked about more uh, recently in recent years as the guy who started the whole rating system and started the whole genre of sheet that Dave Meltzer picked up with the Observer and influenced his writing style. And the greatest guy in the world. Nobody can find him. Nobody can find his sheets. It's like everything just disappeared. And so... Finally, this past week, like I said, Mike Richardson, he contacted us on Twitter and sent us a big stack most of the year of 1981 and some before and a little bit after that. And it's refreshed my memory on shit that I saw in person 40 something years ago, as well as <laughs> you've got a bunch of reasons why, Brian, why you love these sheets and love the talk of the the smart fan population at the time and the way that all this happened, this generation of fans. My thing is I'm most impressed or most interested because this is the same guy seeing different promotion matches all at the time they were happening and grading or describing or reacting to matches from those different promotions in an honest way. He was a fan. I was the only person when he met me, I was the only person that was vaguely even in the wrestling business because I was the photographer. Norman was purely a fan that got smart through his own, you know, entrepreneurial efforts and was trading letters and correspondence with the other smart fans of the time. So you get an idea of how they talked and what they knew and what they didn't knew, didn't knew what they knew and what they didn't know and what they felt about the wrestling that they were seeing. And, you know, when you see that he watched Madison Square Garden matches, and I've told this story before. I was over there for one or two, and we snoozed all the way through the thing. But yet he'd go to a Memphis spot show because the matches were exciting, and that would be great in front of a 1,000 people in Winslow, Indiana. The matches were better than Madison Square Garden. That's not me saying that. That's a fan that had no loyalty to anyone or wasn't beholden to anybody, wasn't trying to protect anybody's feelings, wasn't trying to get a job in wrestling was just commenting on what he saw. 
that to me is some of the interesting shit, especially the way that not only wrestling has changed, but also how the smart fans have changed and the way that it's, they, that it's changed the way that they look at wrestling. Norman Dooley, as you go and read these sheets, in some ways was smarter than anybody currently working in the wrestling business today because he knew that it wasn't about, you know, the, the performance. It was about whether or not you believed in the guy or the guys and what they were doing. So anyway, we've got a bunch of these sheets here, and we're going to go through a few things. And Brian, you've been asking me questions all week, so hopefully you'll ask me some more so I can tell the people. But that's basically the thing is that Norman was the, you. I think you put it, the middle generation. There was a generation of smart fans in wrestling in the late 60s, early 70s that were, you know, Tom Burke up in Massachusetts and Dave Brzezinski up in Detroit and, you know, the, uh, the folks that ran the wrestling fans international association, Don Wilson, and, and even our, our old friend, uh, and colleague Norm Keitzer kind of started out as a smart fan, Jim Melby. And then there was the post Meltzer generation that started after 83 or 84, when it became much more numerous and much more common to have smart fans in every market but from about the late 70s to the early 80s the first generation of tape traders the first generation of smart fans that had access to to video and to more modern technology that was me and and norman and a bunch of the people that went to the wfia conventions walt walansky pete lederberg those guys and that was a generation that kind of changed more in that period of time than the wrestling business did. You know, it's really interesting. If you look at the period of time from like 78 to 82, 83, that's really what it is. And when you talk before about why these are so special, we're going to talk a lot about them and some of the things in them, some of the revelations in them. But Norm Dooley was going to all these shows, St. Louis, various shows, eventually various shows in the territory for you know, what we call Memphis wrestling, but obviously it's not, everyone didn't call it that back then. Right. He was reviewing what he saw live, the big difference. And you could see Dave's, I don't want to say Stokes, that's not right. Dave certainly was influenced by a lot of the writing style of Norman Dooley and yeah. how he critiqued wrestling, certainly the star ratings. The big difference, besides every now and then an MSG review that you guys watched on TV, he only reviewed in Weasel's World what he attended, as opposed to what he got on video. The Observer right. was about, these are the videos I got from around the world. Well, see, Norman wasn't trying to do a bulletin, per se, on the happenings of the entire world of professional wrestling. He didn't cover Japan. He didn't cover the WWF. He didn't cover other territories. He might have a paragraph where he would make mention, so-and-so that used to be here in this area is now wrestling in such-and-such such territory. People that, it had to have some kind of slant or connection to Louisville and its environs, because that's what Nor the service that Norman was providing for his pen pals was, these are the matches that I see in my area, I'm telling you about them, and I want you to do the same for me and yours. And the reason why that he rated, he didn't even usually rate something if we saw it on tape or on television, unless the, the MSG shows, because... That was a thing at the time where that Madison Square Garden cable system, now the fans discovered if you got cable, the few who could get it at that point, you could see the actual live Madison Square Garden show. And a lot of people still didn't have the cable uh, availability to get that. So he was covering that like an event that he went to. But otherwise, it would be what he saw live. And even if he'd get like results from Evansville for me, he would put the results in, but he wouldn't give them star ratings because he didn't see it. Now, if I could say one more thing, uh, and this is probably for a bigger discussion at a later time, and I'm fascinated by everything around this period of time, but Terry Justice started doing his newsletters or bulletins in 1978. Right. Shortly after he got going, a few months later, Norm Dooley appears as a correspondent in one of them, starts doing a report, and there, it was a different report. 
it was what he was seeing on TV and also whatever he saw at the actual show in Louisville. By the time he did Weasel's World, it had kind of moved away from the TV reviews. Yes, because it, he was seeing more. See, here's the thing. Norman didn't drive. Norman was, he was either the same age as me or a year younger, I think, but close, right? And I don't believe that he had been going to the matches as early as I had, like 74, 75, 76 in Louisville, because, it, and he didn't drive, and I I don't remember why at this point, after 40-something years, he, he seemed like his eyesight was an issue. I mean, he could see to write and see to watch wrestling, but that may be something. But his, his, he was like me before I got my driver's license where his mom had to drive him to the events. So I think he started going live to Louisville later on to the live matches. He started watching on TV, but then not only was he able to convince his mother to take him to St. Louis and every once in a while to Indianapolis, but then I started taking him on the loops that I was going to Memphis or, you know, wherever in this territory. And we started going to Cincinnati together when Crockett opened up Cincinnati to just be fans and enjoy the the matches where I didn't have to worry about doing photography. And, you know, but then of course, then we couldn't get as good as seats because I didn't have an in. But that was the thing is, is Norman, you know, slowly got into this. But then we were talking about you and I. I couldn't remember exactly how Norman and I met. I know we met at the Louisville Gardens at the matches, first time in person, face to face. But I believe upon retrospect and trying to think about it, that it was seeing his name from New Albany, Indiana, in one of the Terry Justice bulletins that made me realize, wait a minute, there's another one here in town? And sometime between the end of 1979 and the summer of 1980, we have pieced together. That's when either I may have dropped Norman a line or some way or another, we got together at the matches and discovered that we had the common love. And, you know, that's when, and as a matter of fact, I had just gotten my first VCR and I think Norman followed a few months after that. But then the deal was with me and three or four other friends that liked wrestling when we got the VCR, we found out we needed two because now you can tape shit for yourself, but you can't trade shit with anybody else unless you've got two. And we didn't want to give up our <laughs> original Memphis tapes or our original Japanese tapes. So I sold Norman my first Magnavox VCR sometime in late 1980 when I got one of the new models that had six hour speed. And then he got it and we ended up you know, each of us having at least two VCRs so that we could make videotapes. And whereas I was the completionist and wanted everything and kept everything, Norman didn't want to spend that money. He didn't want to have that storage space. And he would watch shit, copy over onto another tape what he really liked, and then send the, the next one on or reuse it or whatever the case. But it ended up that over over the years, especially when I got in the business and left Louisville, Norman became the guy that continued to tape the Memphis TV for me. And through the rest of the 80s, he sent me all the tapes that he uh, compiled. The AWA tape was all interviews because the matches sucked, you know, but he took the best of all the various territory TVs and sent, sent them to me. And not only that, but actually cataloged because he had so much time on his hands when I was on the road, he cataloged the existing tape collection I had. So now all the tapes I still have, most of them, the contents are listed in Norman's handwriting. So that was, that was what we started doing at that point. And by around the summer of 1980, when we all went to the WFIA convention in Atlanta, that's when we all gave each other nicknames. And Norman, because of his his thick glasses, his light blonde hair, and his resemblance to a skinny John Denver became Weasel Dooley. I was Killer Cornette. Walt Wolanski was Wolf Wolanski. Pete Lederberg had a name, whatever the fuck. And Weasel started at the top of his sheet, started putting Weasel's World of Wrestling. Because this was, again, this was teenage guys doing this shit, you know, because we liked wrestling. 
and just fucking around. We had no delusions we were actually going to be part of the business. That's why mine came out of nowhere. But it was just shit that 18, 19-year-old guys were doing at that time that liked wrestling. And uh, what did he want to do or what did he do? Like, you know, recently I read the last issue of uh, Terry Justice's bulletin that his brother put out after he passed away. And in it, it reveals that he was a bank teller. And I was like, huh, that's really interesting, especially when you consider how many of these he was printing out a week. What about Dooley? What was his occupation or what was he looking to do? I don't know. (laughs) Here's the thing. I never, you know, I'm sorry, but when you were 18 year old wrestling fan in the seventies, you didn't sit around going, well, what would you like to do with your life? You sat around going, God damn it. Why can't they bring Terry Funk back in again? Weasel didn't have a job. And I don't know that he ever tried to get one. And he wasn't a lazy person. I now that you asked that question, I I don't know because, I mean, it wasn't like I was looking for a. I was the photographer at the matches at the Louisville Gardens. I was making more money than I would have some nineteen year old jack off kid would have made doing anything else. You were making more than most of the wrestlers. Some of the wrestlers, some of the wrestlers now, especially, but um, but no, nor and see Norman's mother was an older lady. Um, she was a very nice lady, but she was probably. I guess I think one time we worked out in her early 40s when she had Norman because she was humming around 60 at the time that I met him. And I mean, she'd be 100 years old today if she was still alive. And I hope she is, but I have no idea. And I, I, she, I don't know that she had a job. I'm pretty sure that maybe there was, you know, she is already set up in some respect. They didn't live in a multi-million dollar home. I'm not saying they were rich, but either disability or it had inherited something or whatever the case from Norman's father, who was deceased at that point. But no, um, that's pretty much it. I mean, he had gone to school. He was an intelligent guy, but he didn't have a job, didn't really need a job, didn't drive a car, but, you know, invented the wrestling newsletter system yeah. we know today you know even when you look at these if you remember what the observer looked like when dave first started it up and it was legal size and yeah even eventually when it became a regular size uh newsletter other than issues with the uh, i think it was the flying o the same look <laughs> i mean the typewriter look it's the same exact look as the early observer it's kind of crazy how much dave was clearly influenced by this well, and the one more thing the the whole rating system deal and i know you and and a lot of other people that have just run roughshod with this thing will be uh, now we found the real first five-star match. We think that I'd forgotten about because it came a week before funk and Lawler and that blew everything out of the water. And we found some other things that were written at the time that we've forgotten about, but the star rating system, and we've told the story, but just to make sure everybody's clear, it was as simple as this. I'm talking to Weasel Dooley on the phone one night while I'm reading the TV guide, which everybody back in 1980 kept next to the television because elsewise you wouldn't know what was on TV. And I said, Weasel, I said, as much detail and as much criticism as you go into on these matches, you ought to start rating them like they rate the movies in a TV guide. And he thought that was a great idea. And that's what he started doing. And it was just, like I said, it was just for his 30 or 40 or 50 pen pals. And it was just for us to be tickled by. And we never had any idea that anybody would actually take this seriously. Or more importantly, that there would ever be a day that would come that any wrestlers would give two flying shits and a fucking honk what fans rated their matches in terms of stars like the movies and TV guy. And then when everybody talks about, Oh, it's broken the scale. Well, we broke our own scale because it was just a jack off thing that two teenage guys were doing. So we'd already broken it about six months after we started it. It was just, you know, again, we're going to see this and that's great, but we're going to see that. And that's even better. And but then we're, we've talked about giving six stars to the Louisville Gardens eight-man brawl that 
set everything ablaze with the, those eight man tags in 1981. And then, you know, one of the matches after that got six and a half stars, blah, blah, blah. But no, actually, and I'll say this and I'll quit. Again, the star rating system was supposed to be one star. That shit sucked. Two stars, that was about what we expected. Three stars, that was a really good match. Four stars, they tore the house down. And five stars every once in a while, if Terry Funk or some other world-class talent is involved and they hit on all cylinders. And dud for when the people's feelings were hurt by what they watched. It was like the movies, except we added five stars. And then everybody went insane when Uncle Dave started doing it, and then the modern fan base came along and thought that was something that had always been done and had some importance somehow to somebody. And here we go. Well, two questions for you. And one, as you just said, and this is kind of big, we're going to reveal what we now believe is the true first five-star match, as well as several other ones that seemingly no one has, as these sheets disappeared, no one realized there were other five-star matches out there. But the question I have for you is, in your eyes, the matches, even though this is just two kids jerking off, like you said, the matches that are four stars before the five-star match. So that wouldn't mean it's the best I've ever seen. It just means it's as good as I could expect. What would you say? No, a, a four-star match would be like a four-star movie. This is something you'd want to see again. They tore the house down. This was a great match. This w was, you know, if you had it on video, you'd watch it again. Or, you know, it's it's uh, Gone with the Wind or, you know, Citizen Kane of, of wrestling. It's as good as it can get in that respect. For instance, I have one here, Billy Robinson versus Tony Charles, four stars. Yeah. And that makes sense. I've seen tapes of uh, the one from Memphis, not the one from Louisville, obviously. Well, and then also, but you go in here in these further and you see another Billy Robinson, Tony Charles match, and he gave it two stars. And he mentioned that, wow, as great as the matches between these guys have been before, I was really looking forward to this, but it wasn't much. And that was because of probably the context, the situation, maybe one of the guys had an injury, or maybe they had just realized that now they're just on the card and they're not figured in. Because when Billy Robinson first came in and Jarrett put the CWA world title on him, Jarrett was telling Robinson, I need, because that was Lawler's world title when Lawler broke his leg, I need a guy that can carry a world championship that people will view as a wrestling world champion and get this belt over. And Robinson at first took that to heart. And one of the great matches that he could have is with Tony Charles because they did the world of sports stuff and they did the mat wrestling and they did the chain wrestling and they did all the spots that you see the, especially the British influenced guys of today try to do, but it looks like they're, they're paying homage to Robinson and Charles. It doesn't look like two salty old real shooter fucks snatching this shit and making it look real. It looks like an exhibition, but that's where it all came from. So under those circumstances, Billy Robinson, Tony Charles was a four star match and wow. And they could light the place up, but when they weren't motivated and when they weren't being focused on, and when people were there to see other shit that interested them, both the match may not be as good and the participants may not put as much into it. Now, let me ask you this, because again, I want to try to make this so that any modern fans, younger fans can kind of understand, because you can go out there and I think it's on YouTube, probably Tony Charles versus Billy Robinson from Memphis, which is a different match than the one I'm talking about, but it's still really good. When you give it four stars... Like, you weren't looking at it in a vacuum. Like, oh, they had a great match. It just so happened that the fans were there. The fans were reacting to everything. I yes, think that's, that's one of the big differences. That's one of the most important parts. If the people were sitting there like, eh, okay, the work may be good, the dropkick may be good, but nobody's really excited, and that's the biggest part of it. So, yes, all of the matches that got four stars in one respect or another had people jumping up and down, screaming, throwing babies in the air. It's just how they got there, whether it's scientific wrestling, brawling, blood, whatever the fuck, that's the point. 
if the fans don't give a shit, you didn't have a great match. And one last question before we get to all this about Weasel's World of Wrestling in and of itself, the sheet. He was traveling with you. He was your friend. Was it so inside you didn't worry at all about the idea that someone in the office would find out and get mad at you? Well, because first of all, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was on. I wasn't even there. No, it, you know, I was a little bit farther ahead of Weasel in terms of being smart to terminology and et cetera, just because I'd been around the business. And also, I mean, I I don't think Weasel had ever, maybe he wasn't a fan at that point. He'd never read Whatever Happened to Gorgeous George. Because Babyface and Heel are in that book. But er, Weasel's early newsletters still referred to good guys and bad guys. A uh, dirty wrestler or scientific wrestler. And even I, I've, I've mentioned this, I'd never heard the term high spot until my first day on Memphis television. And I, we didn't know at the time that there was a booker. We thought that Jerry Jarrett, who in our minds was the god of wrestling, was calling all the finishes. We knew there was somebody telling these people what to do and how to do it. But we didn't know there was a booker. We thought the promoter did that. So Jerry Jarrett, who also served often as the booker, we were right sometimes, but we didn't know that sometimes it was Dundee or sometimes it was Robert Fuller. These things are as we're starting to gather all that stuff. To the question you asked, you know, he's already he was already doing it before I knew him, and he was doing it independently of me, and I didn't bother to tell anybody that, yeah, I had the idea for him to rate four stars. Nobody in the Memphis wrestling office ever saw any of Weasel's sheets because he sent them in the mail to other fans in different parts of the country. He didn't advertise it. He didn't sell it. Uh, he didn't want subscribers. It was a pen pal thing. And, and sometimes, you know, I tried to, if I knew something that he didn't give him a little more of an understanding about it, but at the same time, neither one of us were smart and aff affluent and fluent in, you know, carny or inside wrestling lingo. So, no, if I'd have been doing this, I'd have got some heat. But just because I'm bringing a friend of mine from New Albany along to the matches in Memphis, nobody gave it a second fucking thought. And by the way, if anybody has any of these wonderful pieces of history, uh, from Norman Dooley, Weasel's World of Wrestling, Legal Page Sheets, uh, Xeroxed. Uh, we would love them. Contact me and Brian because we are trying to put this collection back together. And it's so weird that everybody who knew Norman, who had these things, can't find them and can't find him. It's it, That is one of the most bizarre aspects of this whole story. Is And I, I mentioned to you, a lot of people are saying, well, Jim, how'd you lose track of him? After the, at the end of the eighties, there was no more territories. So there was no more territory wrestling shows for him to send me on tape. Right. But obviously, I mean, he came to Dallas to my first wedding, um, in 87, we were still friends. And when he was still, you know, uh, uh, uh cataloging some of my videotapes. And then when I moved from Charlotte, to Knoxville or to East Tennessee and started Smoky Mountain Wrestling, I lost track of everybody because I was constantly inundated with shit and I wasn't on the phone with anybody unless it was business. And for that three or four year period, unless you came to me, you know, I, I didn't talk to a lot of people. And during that period of time, like I said, Norman didn't drive. And I think he had slowed down on going to matches at that point because most of us were not interested in wrestling anymore. Um, and then when I came back in 95, I think the, the last time that I saw him in person was I came back to Louisville in 1995 for one of the 25th anniversary gardens uh, event they did. And I know, I remember I saw him there and we talked for a little while and I'm sure that I said, call me. And then shortly after that, we closed down and I moved to Connecticut. And for three more years, I was, you know, quarantined up there. And I feel when I came home to Louisville, 
I knew I'd see Norman at OVW, and we never did. And I don't know anybody that's seen him in 20 years. So if anybody knows where the elusive, mysterious Norman Dooley is or has any more of these sheets, we would love to talk to him or them or you or whatever. Did I say that right, Brian? I think so. And what about him? What if he hears this? Norman, where were you? What did Dutch Mantel say one time? You know what I'd say to my grandfather if he was here right now? I'd say, Granddad, what are you doing here? You've been dead for 15 years. Norman, where have you been all of our lives? We love you, and we he's he's got to be 60 years old like me by now. Holy shit. Anyway, there's a few of these that start out in 1979, and I wish I had one from a couple of weeks beforehand. This was the Jerry Lawler and, and Ken Lucas program that they did at the gardens in December of 79 and January of 1980. And it started off with one of the wildest, bloodiest matches I've ever seen. And over the course of three or four weeks, they had fans hitting the ring to jump Jimmy Hart. And that's where the cop almost pulled a gun on Jerry Jarrett when he was dumping another mark out of the ring and thought that Jarrett was a fan hitting the ring. And these were fucking crazy matches and he did no star ratings yet. And I don't have the sheet on the original match, but nevertheless, here's an interesting one. You might not have this one because I had a couple more from Frank, the collector, but January 24th, 1980 Carrollton, Kentucky national guard armory an outlaw show an independent show before there were such things. Somebody, I think it was it was probably Dale Mann, Big Dale Mann, who used to promote little independent shows here when there were no independents. He'd promote them over near Lexington and various places around the area. Got talent from Bruiser in Indianapolis and ran a spot show in Carrollton, Kentucky at the Armory. And Norman actually went to it. And the main event was Jerry Valiant and Tiny Hampton subbing for Paul Christie, beating Bobo Brazil and Spike Huber. And that was an example. That was probably, you know, I would say one of the earliest outlaw shows of any kind that Norman would have gone to or that they just didn't have them around here. Independent wrestling, outlaw wrestling was not a thing most of the places where there was a full-time territory. But then... And shortly after that, you would get ICW. Yes, and and he's got some great reports here. Some people remember ICW's crowds a little more fondly than they actually happened. But here's the thing I was going to say. He goes to Carrollton, Kentucky at the National Guard Armory to see four matches with bruisers over the Hill Gang, and the next day he's in St. Louis at the Keel Auditorium and a sellout of 11,053 people uh, were there to see Kevin Von Erich beat Jack Briscoe for the Missouri State title and Bruiser Brody and Dick Murdoch beat Andre the Giant and Dick the Bruiser, along with a battle royal and et cetera, et cetera. Norman loved St. Louis wrestling. My thing was, I would, the bloom was off the rose in St. Louis by that point, where it wasn't like the 70s where up and down the card, everybody was a major NWA superstar. So he always wanted me to go to St. Louis with him sometime. The thing is, I didn't have an in over there. I couldn't get ringside, couldn't take pictures. Maybe if I'd asked the magazine, Bill Apter, Norm Kites, or whatever, that blah, blah, blah. But I could make money and enjoy myself by going, if I was going to travel, going to the matches in Memphis or going somewhere else in this territory. I made, you know, uh, uh, arrangements for Cincinnati because that was to see Piper and Snuka and et cetera. But at this time, St. Louis, the main events, two or three main events were huge names. And then the underneath was the Kansas City crowd. And that was, it was feast or famine. The first three or four matches in St. Louis just stunk. And then the main events were great because that's where the talent was. I have a question for you about St. Louis and Weasel Dooley. And it's funny to bring up because I mentioned Terry Justice earlier. At a certain point after the 1979 WFIA convention, he announced he has two new photographers in-house. <laughs> You'll be handling the color photos, and Roger Deem in St. Louis would be handling the black and white photos. Any memories of Roger Deem? But the other question was, when you brought up St. Louis, 
How big a fan of Ted DiBiase was Weasel Dooley? Oh, my God. And see, that's the thing. Weasel was mad when Flair won the NWA title the first time because he thought it should have gone to DiBiase. Because Weasel loved it. And DiBiase was, at the time, the story going around was that there were three people in consideration for the belt, Flair, DiBiase, and somebody else. Who was it? Dusty. Dusty. And... Norman was pulling for DiBiase, but a lot of people were because he was fucking good at that point. And he would have made a classic style NWA champion, but things were changing and they wanted somebody with more personality. So they went with Flair. But on this sheet, after the January 25th, 1980 St. Louis Keel Auditorium show, because Weasel stayed at the Warwick Hotel so he could meet the wrestlers. And he mentions, I had the pleasure of seeing top correspondent and friend Terry Justice once again. Huh. And also to meet Eddie Gilbert for the first time. And that's how Terry Justice got involved in doing bulletins because he met Eddie the year Eddie, before Eddie started wrestling and he wanted to do the Tommy and Eddie Gilbert fan club. And, well, in one of the others, you mentioned Roger Deem. Roger Deem was the photographer in St. Louis and Norman met him. He was a heavy set fellow. Um, but he, I was jealous of him cause he took great pictures and my black and white action work was still, still in its formative stages. And I did a lot of color stuff because that's what they sold at the merchandise stands. Whereas Roger was shooting more for the magazines did black and white, but, but yes, yeah, so we got, uh, we got to be the official photographers of the club. And then Hold on, I was going to flip through this one. He's got another sheet here about March 7th at St. Louis. He never mentioned or never missed St. Louis when he got a chance. How far is that and, drive? Uh, 275 miles. So just four and a half hours down the interstate. But he says, it goes without saying, the highlight of my trip was seeing Ric Flair at the hotel. He had a cab waiting outside, but he took time to sign autographs for quite a few fans and posed for photos. After the card, I waited at the Warwick for the wrestlers to return. Bulldog Bob Brown got the worst response by the fans at the <laughs> hotel. Many of them began barking at him. <laughs> they all knew Bob Brown. He'd been in the territory for 20 years, and he didn't belong on those cards, but he was in the office. So the, the smart fans in St. Louis gave him all kinds of shit. Um, anyway, I was going to this one. Next, because this was June 12th in Cincinnati, June 12th, 1980. And I'm not sure, but I, I'm surprised that Norman was there because hardly anybody else was. My mom and I went up because I went to take pictures. My mom went to help with the gimmick table. And Christine Jarrett and her niece Donna were there because this was the debut of Jerry Jarrett's territory in Cincinnati at the gardens. And I think this was one of two shows they actually ended up running in spring of 1980. Jarrett had gotten TV in Cincinnati after many, many years of effort. And remember we've told the story he couldn't get on channel five because the, the program director there had the tape of the chic with the snake and cutting the job guy's head with the razor blade and said, fuck that. And Buddy Fuller gave it to the station manager thinking it would sell him on wrestling. Yes. Um, but he got TV in Cincinnati and ran this debut card, and it was the absolute worst time because summertime in the Tennessee Territory was big, but not in Ohio. They were wired differently, plus the town had been dark, dead for several years after the Sheik, plus... This was the time where Lawler was out with a broken leg. So Jerry Jarrett tried to open up what would be the biggest or second biggest city in his territory behind Memphis, Cincinnati, Ohio, with five matches and no Jerry Lawler. And the attendance was between four and 500 people in the Cincinnati Gardens. It seated about 11,000. Robert Gibson beat Ken Wayne. Carl Fergie beat the superstar, who was Jerry Novak, the bounty hunter. Jimmy Valiant and Ken Lucas beat Skull Murphy and Gypsy Joe. Paul Ellering was disqualified and retained the AWA Southern Heavyweight title over Sonny King in 15 minutes and 46 seconds. 
And in the main event, Bill Dundee and Ricky Morton beat Wayne Ferris and Larry Latham with their manager, Sergeant Danny Davis. And that was that. And Norman was there, and I didn't know it because I don't think I knew him then because he did not ride with us. So I have narrowed down somehow when I met Norman as somewhere between June and August of 1980 because he went huh. to the WFI convention in Atlanta with me that I've, I saw this just last night. I he was in Cincinnati, but he didn't go with us and I didn't know he was there. Now you could have been corresponding with him before you met him, right? Well, then wouldn't we, we would have met cause we lived 30 miles apart from each other. And he went to the Louisville gardens every week. What puzzles me is we would be going on almost a year and a half of both your names appearing in various bulletins together with your town. So I would think you would have connected before this point. Well, maybe I did then, but he didn't ride with us. Maybe his mother took him. But somewhere in the first fucking part of 1980, I've narrowed it down. Anyway, um, so that was the debut in Cincinnati of Jerry Jarrett's, and I think they ran one more show that we didn't go to and then folded it up. And by the end of the year, Crockett had gotten, and see, the people in Ohio didn't know any of those names, and many of them were not worth knowing. But by the end of the year, Crockett got TV up there in Cincinnati on Channel 5, strongest station, and was drawing six, seven, eight thousand people within six months. I got another one. Hold on here. I'm flipping through. There we go. The first Weasel's World of Wrestling titled as such that I can find is in 1981 with results from January. And they give the card for the February event in Cincinnati, which was Paul Jones and Superstar against Snuka and Stevens for the NWA World Tag Title. Ivan Koloff against Sweet Ebony Diamond, who was Rocky Johnson. Dewey Robertson versus Swede Hansen. Frankie Lane, Jim Lancaster. And Weasel would give his predictions he predicted superstar to pin stevens koloff to pin diamond robertson to beat hansen and he said also on the card is jackie ruffin who will probably wrestle whistler's mother in order to be able to win a match and then a weekend that i remember he was with me you know the time that they brought hulk hogan in to Memphis to wrestle Lawler, right? When sure. Hogan had become Hulk Hogan. 81, yeah. February 9th, 1981. First time Jimmy Hart managed him, right? Yep. Listen to this. We had a week. On February 5th, we were in Winslow, Indiana at the high school gym. On February 6th, we were in Junction City, Kentucky. And then I remember Weasel went with me. February 7th, we went to Jonesboro, Arkansas. February 8th, that was a Sunday. We were in Jackson, Tennessee. And then February 9th at the Mid-South Coliseum and Lawler versus Hogan. Here is the contemporaneous report. Lawler came to the ring with the theme from Rocky II being played on the PA system. And I know because we went to Pop Tunes in Memphis that afternoon after I shot on location pictures of Lawler and picked out the Rocky II soundtrack and listened to it to see if it was good entrance music. <laughs> so anyway, uh, February 9th, Hector Guerrero beat Gypsy Joe, two and a half stars. Eddie Gilbert and Eddie Hogan beat the Angel and Ali Hassan on DQ, three stars. Sonny King, Eddie Gilbert, Eddie Hogan, and Hector Guerrero beat Ali Hassan, the Dream Machine, Gypsy Joe, and the Angel in an eight-man elimination tag match, three stars. Jimmy Valiant beat Tony Charles three stars. Southern Tag Title versus, or Southern Tag Title and Jimmy Kent's hair versus Tommy Rich's hair and Dundee leaving town forever. Dundee and Rich won <laughs> over the Bounty Hunters. Uh, no stars. <laughs> he sent a glance there. Ah, no, no star. <laughs> well, he left him off. <laughs> He didn't say. And then Jerry the King Lawler versus Hulk Hogan. Lawler came to the ring with the theme from Rocky II being played on the PA system. The King was wearing white tights, a white crown, and riding a white horse led by two costumed squires. This type of uh, entrance is not unusual for Lawler. A few weeks ago, he was dropped from the ceiling of the Mid-South Coliseum 
while the theme from Superman was being played. Actually, he was on a rope. They didn't drop him. They lowered him. Um, Lawler body slammed Hogan twice, which was quite the feat. After the body slam, Lawler dropped the strap, which is his trademark. Hogan got down on his knees and begged the king not to hit him. The crowd went totally bonkers, which they did. Hogan threw Lawler into the referee, knocking the official down. Lawler had Hogan covered for the pin, but the ref was still down on the mat. Jimmy Hart jumped in the ring and broke the cane over Jerry's back. The referee got up and disqualified Hogan for outside interference. Lawler got part of the cane and used it on Hogan before he and Hart ran back to the dressing room. Four-star match, because people went crazy. Attendance, 9,007. So again, four-star match before the first five-star match. You definitely want to watch it again. Great match. And again, to Pete, now people would be like, four stars? How could this be four stars? It's Hulk Hogan, and nobody broke a table. It's because in a town they ran every week, 9,000 people showed up to see it and went crazy when they did it. And it was exactly what it was supposed to be. Um, uh, you went past uh, the previous one of Weasel's World. He's reviewing the Indianapolis card on February 28th. He talks about the upcoming lineup with Don Kent versus Dominic Danucci. Help, help, help. The bum is back. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Not a fan of Dominic Danucci in the ring, I'm imagining. Well, because he was... It, see, uh, the thing is with Bruiser's company at that point, everybody was either a local job guy or in their 50s. And it was just brutal. It was horrible. As, here's a correction. Weasel was wrong. Um, apparently a change has been made in a Bruiser's match with Bruiser Brody, but also substituting for Brody on the Indy card on the 28th will be Ox Baker. That's about like replacing Cheryl Ladd with Phyllis Diller. <laughs> <laughs> so you see now where Meltzer got some of his smartassery. Um, we're going to flip through a couple. Here is what well, you were talking about. Go ahead. And that's just interesting, too, and just in terms of fandom and how people are writing. You know, the idea that he knows. Yeah, with Bruiser Brody, I'm going to get excitement. With Ox Baker, you know, whatever fans are supposed to excite with that announcement, obviously he's not one of them, and so many of us wouldn't have been as a replacement for Bruiser Brody. Well, and see, here's the thing. This was 1981. Ox Baker in Indianapolis in 1974 had had a great run and people remembered it. And he was the champion. He worked with Bruiser. And I guess 74 through 76, Ox versus Ellis, Ox versus Bruiser, the cow original Coward Waves the Flag match, I think they had, blah, blah, blah. That worked. Even though Ox was never, you know, Jack Briscoe, it worked. And what a great promo. But now it's, five, six, seven, eight years later, and everybody's older, and everybody's slower, and it's the same thing, and it didn't work then. It's context, it's time, and it's place, and it's also age and fitness of the competitors. But here's the thing. I've, the, the next sheet, February 14th and February 16th, 1981. In Febu on February 14th, Valentine's Day, he went to the Commonwealth Convention Center in Louisville, Kentucky to see an ICW show, the Poffos promotion. The main event, two main events, uh, Bob Roop versus Randy Savage and Pez Watley and Ronnie Garvin against Bob Orton Jr. and Jeff Sword in a Texas death match. So then that was on February 14th. Look at the attendance. And well, and I'm about to get there. The attendance for the card was 250 in Louisville, Kentucky. This is what we've been talking about when people fondly remember ICW now because Randy Savage was there, and in the early days it was Bob Orton Jr., and, and Rip Rogers had a great time there and learned a lot. They never drew a fucking house, not against Jarrett. They could draw when they had a town that only they were running. Some of the eastern Kentucky towns... They put seven, eight hundred people in those spot shows because nobody else was running it. But when they tried to run head to head with Jerry Jarrett, it was a fucking nightmare. The Louisville Gardens was in those days never below. If if there were less than twenty five hundred people in the building for the weekly show, it was because of bad weather, snow, thunderstorms, whatever. 
And that was still not a real good house. And a lot of times it was more like three, 4,000. The ICW shows, they did 250, 300, 350, because that was the people who were going to go see every bit of wrestling. But since Jarrett was in town every week, how much money you got? How, many, how much time you got? How many tickets you going to buy? They just, they couldn't get a break. But here's the thing. On February 14th, he saw the ICW event live. On February 16th, me and Norman both watched the Madison Square Garden show on MSG Cable at his house. And let's compare some things. Because this is the same guy looking at wrestling. It's just two different kinds of wrestling. In February 14th in Louisville, the Bob Roop versus Randy Savage match got three and a half stars from Weasel. And the Texas Death Tag Match got four stars because they did all kinds of bullshit and crazy stuff and boom, boom, boom. And he was into it. And Savage was involved, did a run in. Mentions that Savage's music at the time was hot stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's that. That's what he played. Hot stuff. I want some hot stuff, babe. Donna Summer. This was before Eddie Gilbert became hot stuff. This was uh, that was Savage's ICW music. But anyway, the fight two nights later, <laughs> Moon Dogs and Lou Albano versus Tony Gurria, Pat Patterson, and Rick Martel, two stars. Killer Khan versus Dom DiNucci, one star. Stan Hansen versus Bob Backlund. Listen to this. Backlund has got to be the biggest joke in all of wrestling. Backlund and Hansen were both bloody during the match, although I hesitate to call what Howdy Doody, that was Bob Backlund's nickname with the smart fans. Howdy Doody had on his face as blood. It was shown on TV where Backlund stuck his head under the ring for three days. Coincidentally, when he got back up, he had blood all over his face. Just when the match was starting to get exciting, the referee stopped the match because of excessive bleeding. If they did that at Jarrett's Cards in Louisville, the fans would lynch the referee. Jim Cornette said he's bled more from a popped pimple. By the end of the match, Howdy had all the blood wiped off of his face. I really feel sorry for the WWF fans. I can barely stand to watch Backlund once a month. They have to watch him all the time. Hanson gets four stars. Howdy only won. And then Hulk Hogan versus Rick McGraw was a two-star match. Pedro Morales versus Sergeant Slaughter got three stars because of Slaughter. <laughs> it says... Slaughter looked really good during the match, which is quite a compliment considering he had no opponent. The only the nice thing I can say about Morales is he falls out of the ring good. So the point is, here you got 250 people in the Commonwealth Convention Center in Louisville, Kentucky, watching an outlaw show, but the matches were better than what you saw at Madison Square Garden with 20,000 people there because it was the difference in territories and what the people were educated to if you had showed if the live card for madison square garden had just suddenly walked out in louisville in in those days and had the exact same matches they had in msg it would have killed the fucking town in louisville people would have never come back because they were rotten and it wasn't what the people were used to it wasn't the style or the flavor so i, I think it's interesting when you see a guy, again, who didn't have any professional involvement with wrestling, was just a fan, the, the different way that he rated the different territory matches. And then there's one coming up I know you want to talk about. Well, Jim, a couple other notes from these reviews here of these uh, two shows that you pointed out, because it kind of goes into what we were talking about earlier, the style of writing and the snark, as you put it. From the ICW show Match 3... Limping Lanny Poffo <laughs> beat Hustler Rip Rogers with a sunset flip in 1601. I hate to admit it, but Lanny does have some good wrestling moves. Three stars. <laughs> and then if you go to the MSG show, oh boy, thankfully the time isn't here. SD Jones versus Baron Sakuna. Ooh. Both men look terrible. During the match, it looked like they were giving each other a massage. <laughs> One and a half star, but we don't get who won or what the time was. 
Yeah. Uh, this, you know what? This popped me just because it's a name that I hear Lance Russell saying, and it makes me laugh for no good reason. The Hangman versus Frank Savage. This bout was a little better than the first match, but not by much. The guillotine that the Hangman used at the end of the match looked good. The Hangman was much better when he wrestler as John Louis a few years ago. Yeah, now he wrestle. looks awful. Obviously, he meant that, but I hear Lance Russell in my head. John Louis! John Louis! Because he, he worked as Hangman Neil Gway, and he was also, as you just mentioned, the, the Hangman in the WWF, but for some reason, when they brought and he was French of some description, either French-Canadian or French or whatever, but when they brought him down here and teamed him up with Joe LaDuke, they gave him his name... <laughs> I think it was supposed to be Jean Louis. That sounds French, right? But the way right. that they would print it in the newspaper ads was John J O H N Louis L O U I E. <laughs> so all these fucking Southern, that's old John Louis. <laughs> Sounded as French as I do. Well, Jim, before we wrap things up, and there are so many of these, and we're going to go through them. We're we're going to do multiple parts on this right. because there's a lot of stuff in here a, as you go through in chronological order that has been lost to history. But you were just tickled pink as some as, about something that we found. You want to spill the beans or you want me to? Well, I'll just say that one of the cool revelations in going through these is that while you previously revealed here on the show, I think the first ever six-star match... And the first six and a half star match, now that I think yeah. about it. We all assumed that the very first five star match was Jerry Lawler versus Terry Funk. Yes, we did. And it turns out not only was there more than one Jerry Lawler versus Terry Funk five star match, but that was not even the first known five star match. And we have a new one for you to reveal here today. And I was there for that one too, and I didn't even remember it. But here's the, the fucking deal is, as I mentioned, uh, Norman and I would go to Cincinnati. And sometimes, every once in a while, we'd take somebody else, sometimes just be us. But the first times that Crockett started running Cincinnati, the shows were always on weekends. And usually my weekends were free because Louisville ran on Tuesday, Evansville, Indiana on Wednesday, Lexington, Kentucky, first Thursday of every month, or a Kentucky spot show on Thursday. I was during the middle of the week I was doing my work, and then the weekend was free unless I went to Memphis. So we started going to Cincinnati, and then for whatever reason, they switched up and started running Cincinnati every once in a while on a Monday night. And so one particular week, we did a Cincinnati on Monday, Louisville on Tuesday, Evansville on Wednesday. It was uh, hectic. And that was two uh, about a week and a half before the very first Jerry Lawler Terry Funk match in Memphis, March twenty third, nineteen eighty one, that we have talked about, was so fucking crazy. So I and then Weasel, who did not go with me to the March twenty third match, that I thought that he had instead, according to his sheets, it was later. It was a couple of weeks later. On April 6th, that Weasel went with me to Memphis when Lawler and Plowboy Frazier wrestled both of the Funks, Terry and Dory. So all of these were being conflated in my 40-year-old memories, but it comes down to this. On March 9th in Cincinnati, Ohio at the Gardens, it was probably the best card that Crockett ever put there. And there were several main events that were incredible, including, you remember from seeing the, the videotape, Black Jack Mulligan in the Carolinas and the Iron Sheik, when he could still go, had a heck of a fucking program and a long-running series of matches, right? Right. And we got to see Black Jack Mulligan against the Iron Sheik. Um, this was, hold on, I'm trying to, because I'm trying to read, uh, Weasel didn't do paragraphs well. Mulligan pinned the Iron Sheik with a flying cross body off the top rope. Nine minutes, 33 seconds, got four stars because, again, this was one of the wild ones, double juice, people are going crazy. 
Then they followed it up with a completely different style of match, Ricky Steamboat and Jimmy Snuka, two athletes like that. And the Snuka at the time was the most impressive physical specimen we were seeing. When he was a heel in the Carolinas in the early 80s and still in shape, it was amazing. That one, um, not only did uh, Steamboat beat Snuka, but then they had a big brawl after it was over. That got four and a half stars. And then for the United States heavyweight title, Rowdy Roddy Piper versus Nature Boy Ric Flair. And Flair got in the ring, and I remember this. Pi minutes passed before Piper came out. And then he came out doing his whole thing, the bagpipes, blah, blah, blah. Flair stopped him, got into it, and they had a heck of a fucking match. Tommy Young was the referee. I'd never even met Tommy at that point, but that, these are the first times I'd seen him in person. And basically, uh, Flair and Piper tore the house down for 20 minutes, and Flair won on disqualification. Piper kept the United States title, and Weasel described it as, this was the best match that I have seen in quite some time. Five stars. So he didn't even say we're breaking the scale for this one, so I'm wondering if he did it before, because like I said, since it meant so little to us as a thing in relation to everything else, what we were seeing, the results of the match, etc., cetera, is just something we did. He may have done it before, but this is definitely before Flair and Funk on March 23rd and... Hold on, I got to flip a couple pages because what he wrote on the March 23rd match, because he didn't go with me on that one, I thought he had. Jerry Lawler beat Terry Funk. Both wrestlers were extremely bloody during this match, which lasted more than 15 minutes. And plus, this was shown on television the week after. Um, obviously, uh, disqualification, Funk was not able, or not disqualification, but Funk was not able to get back in the ring and was counted out. I was told that on a scale, and I would have been the one to tell him, on a scale of one to five, that this match was an eight. <laughs> so, wait a minute, this is news. The first, the first eight, star, eight match. star match was well, Lawler versus it, Funk, but it wasn't legitimate because I was the only one that felt that way, and Weasel was not there to to examine it further. But that was the thing is that I remembered Lawler and Funk being so far above. It just the display of violence and insanity by Terry Funk that night. The people, I've seen a lot of wrestling crowds excited. I've never seen them shocked like they were making shocked noises. And when you go back and look at the tape and the, the women in the front row crawling backwards over the backs of their chairs to get away from Lawler swinging the chair at Funk and just all the chaos. But... It was a couple of weeks later, as I mentioned, on April 6th that Weasel went back down to Memphis with me. We stopped in Jackson at the Coliseum, then did the 6th, the Monday night, and that was the Funks against Lawler and Frazier. And now I had gone down a week or two beforehand and seen Jerry Lawler and Jack Briscoe against Dory and Terry Funk. And that was a good match but it wasn't as good as Jerry Lawler and Plowboy Frazier against Terry and Dory Funk. And people are saying, what's wrong with this fucking picture? There's no way that Plowboy Frazier was in any way as good of a talent as Jack Briscoe. The difference was that Briscoe and Dory wanted to wrestle and do their shit. And Jack Briscoe wasn't over in Memphis. The only time that Briscoe had ever appeared in Memphis was to lose to Jerry Lawler and to defend the title against Ron Fuller, you know, six years previously. So with Dory and Jack trying to wrestle, the blood feud that Lawler and Terry had started was not on display in that match, and that's what people wanted to see. They wanted to see the violence of Lawler and Terry Funk. So they come back in a Texas death match, falls don't count, Jimmy Hart suspended above the ring, uh, so he can't interfere. And then this match was goddamn chaos. And I'll read Weasel's description of it, and then we'll fold this up. Because 
when they were lifting Jimmy Hart up over the ring, he was in a he wasn't even in a cage. He was in a sling like I've had to do, and they just raised him up so he's dangling by the rope. So Weasel starts. When Hart was being lifted up, Terry grabbed him and held on. They started swinging back and forth until Funk finally let go and fell down to the floor. Terry Funk was absolutely unbelievable. I was sitting at the announcer's table for the matches. We put him with Lance because we didn't have a ticket for him. Well, Terry came walking around the ring before the match started and grabbed the table I was sitting at. Funk turned it upside down and broke off one of the legs with one swift kick. First fall, Dory pinned Lawler after the Funks double-teamed him. Seven minutes, ten seconds. Second fall, Dory pinned Lawler again. Fifty-six seconds. Third fall, Frazier pinned Dory after a leg drop. Five-seventeen. Fourth fall, Plowboy pinned Dory with another leg drop. Fifteen seconds. Fifth fall, Frazier pinned Terry. Two-eleven. Sixth fall, Terry pinned Plowboy after hitting him below the belt. One-thirteen. During the seventh fall, Jimmy Hart took off the fo football helmet he was wearing and threw it down to Dory, who hit Lawler on the head with it. Terry was already on the mat. Lawler joined him after the helmet incident. Referee Jerry Calhoun counted to 10, and neither man got up, so the seventh fall was a draw. After the 30-second rest period, both Lawler and Terry were still on the mat and unable to get up by the count of 10. The referee said the first man to his feet would mean his team would win the match. Lawler got up first, so he and Frazier were declared the winners. The match itself was great, and based on my rating system, would deserve six stars. Dory was fairly good, Lawler was very good, Frazier was actually all right, and mere words cannot do justice to Terry Funk. He was great. The guy is a lunatic, but that's one of the main reasons I like him so much. There was so much mayhem in this bout that it would take forever to list it here. It was a truly unbelievable match. So you can remove one guy. You can trade Jack Briscoe for Plowboy Frazier and change the entire demeanor of the whole thing in a positive manner if it's done right. And the same guy that's watching Ric Flair and Roddy Piper in front of 8,000 people at the Cincinnati Gardens says that Lawler and Frazier against the Funk Brothers two weeks later was actually better than that. You know, to go back to what we were talking about earlier and the influence over Dave Meltzer and the Future Observer, when we look at the sheet with the first five-star match that we know of, Flair versus Piper, that's crazy. That's now the first known five-star match, Flair versus Piper. Here are some news and notes at the bottom here. Rick Morton is now wrestling in Oklahoma. Considering the talent there, Rick should be in the main events. Tommy Gilbert is now in Puerto Rico. He won't be missed. Don Morocco was at the last WWF TV tapings. Baron Von Raschke has been making appearances in the AWA as a good guy. The good Baron is scheduled to wrestle Crusher Blackwell in St. Paul on March 22nd. Hector Guerrero and Eddie Hogan have apparently left the area. Guerrero was bearable. But Hogan was terrible. And by the way, that's Brutus Beefcake in another yes, life. Right. Billy Robinson has been appearing in Mexico. Tony Charles has also left the area. Ted DiBiase may be going to Florida. George's loss. Bill Dundee and Tommy Rich won the CWA World Tag Team titles from Dutch Mantel and Austin Idol in Lexington, Kentucky on March 12th. The Dream Machine is split with Jimmy Hart, is now teaming with Bill Dundee, and the Mid Atlantic promotion has now moved into Detroit, Michigan. A card was held there on March 7th. So in terms of the tone, in terms of some of the snark, the star ratings, clearly very influential. Well, and here's one more thing, because uh, after the Memphis match, Lawler and Frazier Funks, we had to drive all, of, all the way back 400 miles overnight. The next day was the Louisville matches. And Louisville was always... A, a week behind Memphis on the TV and on the cards. And some cases we didn't get what Memphis got at all. But in this case, the main event in Louisville on April 7th was Lawler versus Funk for the Southern title. No time limit, no disqualification that we've already seen in Louisville, the first match between them. This is bringing it back. And here's the description. 
After coming out to the ring, Funk tried to attack the announcer. Nobody's safe when Terry Funk is around. That would have been Bob Moody at that point, too, I believe, and he probably would have shit himself, as I recall. Terry once again tore up the announcer's table. He used part of it on Lawler. When he hit Jerry on the head with it, he almost knocked him out. Someone seated next to me started yelling that she wanted Lawler. Funk heard her and promptly threw Jerry out of the ring in front of her, looked at her and yelled, there he is! <laughs> Most of the match took place outside the ring. After taking quite a bit of punishment during the match, Jerry started bombarding Terry with punches. Lawler gave Funk a tremendous fist drop off the ropes and then pinned the former NWA champion. During the pin, Jerry held Funk's trunks. After the match, Dory Jr. came out and complained about that. Terry challenged Lawler to another match. Terry said the fans, police, and the referee were all on Lawler's side. He wanted them all to leave, and then he wanted another bout with the king. The Funks finally went back to the dressing room, but not until after Terry had a number of altercations with the fans. 20 minute, 38 second time on the, on the fall and five stars for that match. And I remember that one. Because it was just crap. Funk was coming out every night for 30 minutes and putting on a clinic in how to take over a fucking building. And it wasn't even for money. I'm sure Terry has made more money. And I've seen a lot of Terry after that. This was the first time I'd ever gotten a chance to see Terry live on a regular basis. This is the best shit that he ever did. And I don't, it was just, was it the chemistry with him and Lawler? Was he wanted to prove something? Was somebody, he's just going to a new area and he wants to get over? But he scorched the fucking buildings during this. That's why we were all driving everywhere we could in the territory to see every match he had because we knew it wasn't going to last and we couldn't miss this shit. And on the under undercard of that match I just described, it was supposed to be Dory Funk Jr. versus Billy Robinson for the CWA title. And you think, wow, that could have some something to it right funk and robinson that's a pretty fucking interesting wrestling match robinson no showed guess who replaced dory funk jr or guess who replaced robinson against dory funk jr who sonny king oh dory funk oh, jr there's a versus... match i would never want to watch oh my god dory funk oh. jr versus sonny king dory oh. was scheduled to wrestle billy robinson for the cwa title but robinson was not there funk did not do much in this match with king but in all fairness to dory sonny is not a suitable opponent dory did pin king to win the match in 14 minutes and 17 oh. seconds oh my God. <laughs> one one and a half stars and i'm pretty sure he was being nice to dory funk jr wow 15 minutes of that can you imagine yeah, I, I was there. Oh. I saw it. Yes. And then what? One more thing. I'm just going to try to. I'm trying to remember whether it was the. Uh, was it May the fifth? No, that's that was Blackwell. Where is? I have the one. Was it the previous week in Louisville? Possibly. I'll find it, but he also covered the one where Lawler and Funk had the double juice pull apart in Louisville, and the athletic commissioner. <laughs> got on a microphone and tried to stop him by saying, hey, boys, break it up. And Lawler looked down at him and said, if, if you think it's over, you get your ass in here and try to break it up. Ah, here it is, May 12th, Louisville Gardens. This is when Funk came out after the, the uh, uh, empty Coliseum match and Lawler had kicked the wooden spike into his eye. He comes out with an eye patch. And basically, he got juice, and he had a white eye patch, white eye wrapping on, and by the time the match is over, it's completely red. And they're fighting all over the place and outside the ring, and finally, Paul Morton stops it, declares it no contest. Funk gets what appears to be an ice pick from Jimmy Hart, tried to get Lawler in the eye with it. At that point, El Toro, Vinny Romeo, Jimmy Kent, Dutch Mantel, Dream Machine, Jerry Novak came out to the ring to separate Lawler and Funk. The Kentucky State Athletic Commissioner got the microphone and told him to stop, and Lawler looked at the commissioner and said, if you think it's over, get your ass in the ring and try to stop it. Funk and Lawler were finally separated after about 10 minutes of sheer pandemonium after the time on the fall was 2147. So they're out there for 30 minutes, bleeding, breaking shit, 
fucking screaming funk pig suey pig it was insane that people were jumping up and down the cops were holding them back from the rope around the ring this was the atmosphere they created this was five stars according to weasel dooley and the first six star match would have been a month later no that would have been a month earlier if the the tag match in Memphis with Lawler and Frazier was a month earlier. Oh, that's right. That was sick. Yes. You know, I'm thinking of the old first and, six but then, match. But then, see, again, because, <laughs> because we didn't take it seriously. We weren't paying attention. But then later on, it was, you know, the, uh, the big Louisville Gardens brawl, ah, which was on May 26th. Uh, they had the big eight-man Louisville Gardens brawl. He closes up. There was so much assorted mayhem and pure pandemonium, it was impossible to keep track of it all. The brawl after the match lasted 15 minutes. The match definitely deserves the rarely bestowed rating of six stars for outstanding achievement in the art of Pier six brawling. But then again, you know, other... Well, one more. We have to do go one ahead. more then, since we've okay. re revealed these. Jim, if you go to eighty-one thirty-two, there's a revelation of one last five-star match. Hold on, hold on. From June eighteenth, Lexington, Kentucky. Oh, Randy Savage versus Ronnie Garvin on an ICW show at Lexington's Henry Clay High School. It says that Jared in Lexington was running Rupp Arena, twenty-five thousand seat building. Of course, it was split down the middle, and they were drawing seven or 8,000. But ICW was running in Lexington, their home base at the Henry Clay High School, and they would do, you know, several hundred people or whatever the case. But on this particular night, it was Randy Savage versus Ronnie Garvin for the ICW title, no DQ, and Garvin's hair was up against Savage's belt. And they bumped the referee, and Savage at the time had a manager named Steve Cooper, Steve Cooper, man. Can't believe what you did to Steve Cooper, man. And he was like an old-fashioned Lawler manager like, you know, Mickey Poole had been, where he was just a stooge for Savage. Wore a tuxedo, threw in the gimmick or distracted the referee or whatever when necessary. And basically they did a swerve where when the referee got knocked down, Steve Cooper held up a metal chair and Savage rammed Garvin into it and Savage covered Garvin, but when the referee counted three, Savage was declared the winner and tried to, uh, uh, you know, so they tried to do the head shaving, but Garvin went crazy, hit Randy Savage in the head with Cooper's cane. It says Savage fell out of the ring, and then Garvin gave Cooper a pile driver. Garvin chased Savage to the dressing room. Ronnie came back out to the ring and cut Cooper's hair off with a pair of scissors. He also cut off Cooper's beard. Then Ronnie put an enormous amount of shaving cream on Steve's head and used a razor to shave all the hair off his head. Garvin also put some of the shaving cream in Cooper's mouth and in his pants. Ronnie then got a bucket of water and poured it over Steve's head to get rid of the shaving cream. After yelling at him and spitting on him, Garvin finally went back to the dressing room. The match itself was 8 minutes 23 seconds, but the barbering escapade lasted 15 minutes. The bout only deserved three and a half stars, but the incident afterwards elevated it to a five-star rating. Because basically, they booked a hair match where neither guy was going to get their head shaved. How many times have I even been involved in it? How many times have you heard that? It never works. But in this case, Garvin said, fuck it. They took the flunky, cut his hair off, shaved his head, shaved his eyebrows, humiliated him. And everybody had fun with it. And because of that atmosphere they created, okay, fuck it. Five stars. Because it's meaningless anyway. Did the fucking, did the people enjoy it? And was it su what it was supposed to be? That's the, the question. You know what? I don't think we can wrap up just yet. One more sheet because it ties into everything we're talking about. So we got to tie this up, end on the right note. Well, and, and hold on. I found one here. He went with me to... Uh, to a spot show that that was that Huntingburg show that drew hold on Huntingburg. I can't, yeah Huntingburg Indiana we 
We did like almost 3,000 people in Huntingburg, Indiana one night for a spot show. And he went, he, we even had to press Weasel in to help on the, uh, at the gimmick mat table. Okay, go 81, ahead. 20, your... Was it 8124 that you're looking for? Uh, possibly 8124. Huntingburg, Indiana. Yeah. The attendance for this card was over 3,000 based on the gate because of four and $5 tickets. We did almost $15,000. Ringside, which seated 600 people, was sold out well in advance. The population for Huntingburg is 5,073. And uh, But uh, again, spot show matches. Dutch Mantel and Coco Ware beat Masafuchi and Mr. Onita at Sushi Onita. Three stars for a 10-minute tag team match at a spot show. That's That was the best match of the night, and that's all you need at a spot show. They made a fucking fortune that night. What did you want to end on? Well, let's end on this. 8122, there are two very interesting things. One about the empty arena match tying into everything with Lawler and Funk, and the other about a match that people today, some people still consider the best match in MSG or the best match in the WWE. Patterson versus Slaughter, the alley fight. Oh, okay. Um, well, and actually this clears up Somebody was confused as to exactly what date the Funk Lawler empty Coliseum match took place because it wasn't obviously advertised because there were no fans there and there were no tickets sold to it. And I had been told uh, at the time that Funk flew in and they did it the Monday afternoon before the matches. And this verifies that because somebody else was saying that uh, they couldn't narrow down the exact date that it took place. So it was April 13th, 1981. And it says the rematch of the century took place and nobody showed up to watch it. Terry Funk issued a challenge to Jerry Lawler to wrestle him when no one was there. Funk had complained that Lawler had the fans, the referee, the police, and everyone else on his side. And he wanted a match with nobody there except for a film crew. The bout took place at one o'clock in the afternoon with only Lance Russell and two cameramen present. During the match, Funk and Lawler fought all over the Mid-South Coliseum. Funk tore up the ringside steps and had a jagged piece of wood he was going to use on Lawler. Jerry kicked Terry's hand, trying to knock the stick out of his hand. Instead, the force of it sent Funk's arm up and the stick hit Terry right in the eye. Funk's eye became so bloody the tape had to be edited for TV. Terry yelled for the match to be stopped, so Lawler was declared the winner. And that was his uh, review of the empty Coliseum match, and then the May 4, 1981 in Madison Square Garden card. How about that third match on that card? Peter Maivia pinned Rick McGraw with a backbreaker over the knee. It says Maivia is even fatter than Hippo Harley Race. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we liked Harley, but Harley in 1981-82, he gained some weight. Oh, he destroys Harley in a few of these here. Yeah. Um, and on that card in Madison Square Garden, WWF title Bob the Bum Backlund versus Angelo Mosca. That got one and a half stars. The main event uh, was Tony Gurria, Rick Martel, and Gorilla Monsoon substituting for Andre the Giant against Stan Hansen, Lou Albano, and Moondog Rex, two stars. Oh, I'm sorry, they put the midget match on last. Carolina Kid and Farmer Jerome beat Sky Low Low and Kid Chocolate, one and a half stars. But the alley fight. You know, this is good because most people, I guess most fans of any kind of classic wrestling have seen the alley fight Patterson and Slaughter. They've seen it on tape because it exists. It's out there. It was a famous match. So this will give you an idea of where that match placed in terms of matches that you didn't see that Weasel saw. Uh, his description is Pat came out wearing an I love New York t-shirt, blue jeans, cowboy boots, and a New York Yankees cap, which he threw out to the crowd, obviously, because he was the baby face. Slaughter entered the ring wearing what else fatigues? Patterson attacked him at the start of the bout. Pat took off his belt, hit the Sarge with it, and used it to choke Slaughter. Later on, Pat used the boomerang, the boomerang move to throw Sergeant head first into the ring post, which opened a pretty bad cut on his forehead. Pat took off his cowboy boot and hit Slaughter on the head with it several times. He also rammed the Sarge into the ring post a few more times. The Grand Wizard threw a white towel in the ring, so Patterson was declared the winner. I have been watching the MSG card since last September, and this was easily the best match that I have ever seen from there. 
14 minutes, 13 seconds, four stars. The best four stars WWF match that he had seen at that point, and one of the most legendary matches of all time in that company, got four stars because it was so far and above anything else you saw from the WWF at the time. But it wasn't as good as shit we were seeing in Cincinnati and shit we were seeing in Louisville on and Memphis. That show. On Look down. Live events. May 5th. Let's end with this because it's the same sheet. May 5th, Louisville, Kentucky. Talking four star uh, matches. Okay. Well, and this was Crusher Blackwell's, actually, not only his Louisville debut, the only time we got to see Crusher Blackwell. And a lot of AWA fans in 84, 85 are going to go, huh? There was a window of time from about, what, 1979 to early 1982 when Crusher Jerry Blackwell was better than Bam Bam Bigelow. He was better than Vader. He was was the best big man in the business, better than anybody that would come along before or after of that shape. It was a very short window, but it was there. And because Vince he, tried to get him. He was one of the first guys Vince tried to get from the AWA, and he decided yep. at the last minute not to do it. And within two years, he was back home in Georgia in Ill, Ill health running an outlaw group because the weight caught up with him and he didn't take care of himself. He had high blood pressure, sleep apnea, the whole nine yards. But the main event, May 5th in Louisville, Jerry Lawler versus Crusher Blackwell. Blackwell was brought in by Jimmy Hart trying to get the bounty on Jerry, trying to put Jerry Lawler out of, out of wrestling like he had been with the broken leg. And anyway, um, so he was bringing in Hulk Hogan, the Funks, the people like Blackwell. And I remember this match. It was amazing. At the start of the match, they stand in the middle of the ring and the referee calls for the bell and Blackwell jumps up at six feet tall and 460 pounds and dropkick Lawler right on the chin. And the whole place went, oh boy, we didn't, because me and Weasel were were the smart fans. We'd been watching Georgia TV, and we knew that Southeastern, the incarnation of Southeastern under Barnett, had used Blackwell. But a lot of people in the gardens had only maybe seen a little TBS cable and never seen him live. And they shit themselves. And then Weasel goes on. I was amazed at some of the things Blackwell did. Flying knee drops, elbow drops, leg drops, big splashes. Blackwell gave Jerry a power power slam, which was better than any other power slam I've ever seen. Blackwell threw the king out of the ring, gave him a flying elbow drop on the arena floor. Back in the ring, Lawler threw Crusher into the turnbuckles. The force sent him over the top rope onto the ring apron and the big man then landed out onto the floor. He, yeah, he, that Crusher Broomfield, one man gang, when he was with ICW, the reason why they named George Gray Crusher Broomfield was a takeoff on Crusher Blackwell because he was the only guy that size they'd ever seen that could do that shit again. Uh, anyway, Blackwell missed a big splash off the ropes. Lawler quickly covered him for a three count, 13 minutes, 16 seconds. I was impressed that a man Blackwell's size can do the things he does. His quickness is unbelievable. I wouldn't mind seeing him again at 468 pounds. He's phenomenal. And that was a four-star match about the same length of time and the same rating that he gave the alley fight. The day before. The day before he gave the day after to Jerry Lawler and Crusher Blackwell. And I would, I would have to agree in its own way. They were completely different matches with different stipulations but they were as good as they could be given the circumstances. And we still have to, and we're going to do more on this because coming up in June of 1981, there's a booking lesson here and we can do a segment on the program, which we will probably maybe even next week on how Jerry Jarrett managed to create a concept and in three weeks, use it to nearly sell out the mid South Coliseum on the fifth show of the month when they'd been there for five weeks. And that was a tribute to basically I've, I've said this before booking is not telling guys how to have a great match or coming up with an amazing new move or an exciting new gimmick or stipulation 
booking is putting the talent you have in a position to sell the maximum amount of tickets possible based on getting people interested in what those individuals are doing in relation to each other, not just guys hitting each other over the head with blunt instruments. And this is one of the classic examples of that. I will tease you with when Jerry Jarrett invented the dream match. Not the dream match we have in modern days, but the dream match that they sold out the Mid-South Coliseum with. We'll pick up on that next week, okay? I think that sounds great. This was a lot of fun and a big revelation. And of course, it's been so long, I forgot we talked about bad wrestling too. So a good week here on the show. <laughs> and you know, and once again, uh, you know, you say that this shaped modern fandom and let the beast known as Uncle Dave loose. I say it's just amazing to go back and look at how that smart fans from 40 years ago didn't know the terminology, didn't know how everything was done and didn't know who was making the decisions and still had a better grasp on what the wrestling business is and is supposed to be than the fucking fans of today that know everything that's ever happened or think they do. It's an amazing difference. Anyway, closing thoughts on that, Brian? We will see you later this week. Again, our schedule is still a little off because of construction and summer and all sorts of things, but later this week... We will have a brand new drive through and it'll be fantastic. Yes, we will. I don't know whether it's construction or destruction, but anyway. <laughs> All right. Join us later on, folks, when we have another just wingding wonderful time. And until then, for Brian, I'm Jim Thay and Weasel, wherever you are. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>